Kenny was a mother of two adult children. Kenny was a grandmother. Kenny worked for Kidney Health for nearly 20 years. He was confused. That reaction there. Uh, he, as we were all standing out there in the right wing of residence, he had shoved his hands in his front pants pockets and were shaking them, rubbing them back and forth in a very fast manner. She was, um, she was looking at me with the horse. Please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, Hit the subscribe, like, and share. Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gizzela K. This is Grizzly True Crime and today we're going to be watching day three of this Daniel Howard trial together. It is a trial happening in Idaho and the guy was actually a former Idaho State Trooper, ISP, Idaho State Police Trooper and a former Marine and he's on trial for the murder of his wife, Kendi Howard, who you could see pictured up there. Thank you to Grizzly Cat for always finding such beautiful pictures. I feel like I scour the whole internet and I never find such beautiful pictures. That one is so nice. So that is a picture of the victim, Kendi Howard. Uh, welcome to all my uh, moderators first. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Welcome to all my patrons. If you are on Patreon, I just posted some pictures for you. A little bit of Switzerland. Um, so hopefully you'll enjoy that. And welcome to all my members, subscribers, everybody. Okay, I hope that you have watched day one and two. If not, don't worry, you can catch up real quick. I've time stamped everything for you. And as you know, we are one day behind the live day coverage, right? Which is great for defluffing as well. So I've done my best with this as well. It's a, it's a, it's pretty well defluffed, but I'm sure there's still going to be some paper flapping and things because it's just how it is. <laughs> so we're watching day three yet together. I do also want to say that, wow, when I was busy editing this footage, they actually showed an autopsy photo by mistake, I believe. And they showed the victim's like breast and her mouth. And I'm like, no, 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 no. So I've cut that out, okay? We're not going to be showing that at all. As you know, if you've been here for a while, you know that's how we roll. We want to make sure we always respect the victim and their families, of course. Today, um, Kendi's parents will be testifying right at the very end. So first there's uh, coroners, you know, forensic pathologists. Police officers, we're going to see more body cam. We're going to see crocodile tears from the defendant. He's sitting right here, by the way. I don't know why his neck looks so red over here. <laughs> um, yeah, Rob's like defluffing and paper flapping. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started with this. Please do like and share so that others know that we are live right now and they know what we're doing. If anyone asks, if you see people rolling and say, what? Why are you on day three when today's actually day four? Let them know. It's because we're defluffing, but also because we started a day late. It just is how it is. Hopefully we'll catch up this weekend. Kimberly in Japan. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> thank you guys all for the comments with my hair. I just felt it was time for a little trim. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, thank you so much to everyone who's sending PayPal's. Oh my word. Stop it, you guys. You're too sweet. It's my birthday on Saturday. So people have been all week already sending me PayPal gifts and buy me a coffees. And I appreciate it so, so much. Okay. So let me play this. I'm going to make sure it's at 1.1 speed as well. I've done my very best to boost the color, to boost the sound. The court audio is pretty crap, okay? If you're not sure, maybe watch just a little bit. I'm not throwing shade, okay? I love it that they've got cameras in the courtroom and that all these mainstream media channels can stream it and news channels and things, right? But the court audio is so crap sometimes. Without the boost, I don't know how we'd be able to hear it. I'm a little hard of hearing. I don't know how I'd be able to hear it if we didn't boost it a bit, right? <laughs> Janet's like last of the 39. That's true. I'm turning 40. <laughs> okay. So day three, here we go. I hope that you are a little bit caught up with the case. If you're not, don't worry. Just hit more on the description box and then you will learn all about the case because I've got a write up there for you. And before anyone even comments on the size of my mug, let me just show it to you because this is, this is my home mug. You guys thought my other mugs are big. This is how we drink tea over here. <laughs> 
it has to be at least the, <laughs> the size of my head okay yeah that's right it's like a teapot <laughs> it's a cup so that's my then my earl grey tea for this afternoon all right let's play it the jury for this morning, so thank you. Ma'am, could you please advise the jury uh, what your name is and spell your name? My name is Tina Tippi, T I P K E. And Ms. Tippi, um, are you currently employed? No, I'm retired. Retired. And um, where did you retire from? Cuban County 911 Center. 911 Center. And so were you a dispatcher at the 911 Center? A dispatcher call picker. And how long were you a dispatcher for Kootenay County? 29 years. Congratulations on your retirement. Thank you. Um, did you work at the uh, 911 center with a, a Janice Wadsworth? Yes. And uh, as a dispatcher, um, did you use the same CAD uh, system and recording systems that Janice uses? Yes. Um, were you working as a dispatcher on February 2nd, 2021. Yes. And on... Oh boy, so we're going to hear the 911 call from the day. On February 2nd of 2021 is the day that Kendi Howard was allegedly murdered. Her husband's on trial for murder. The defense is saying that it was her taking her own life. I've noticed that by me saying the other word, you know when one takes their own life, Ooh, that's a very naughty word for YouTube. They literally checked on me like, are you okay? Your audience is worried about you because you keep saying this word. And I'm like, okay, YouTube, my word. We'll do it PG-13, even though it should, it's a word everybody should know. And it's all about mental health awareness and all that. But anyway, the defense is saying that she took her own life, which I don't personally believe based on what we've heard so far. Um, but it was on February 2nd of 2021. Okay, so that's the date they just asked this retired 911 dispatcher about. So I'm thinking we're probably going to hear the 911 call that the defendant made. That date, do you remember receiving a 911 call just before 10.45 in the evening from a Dan Howard? Yes. And um, pursuant to that 911 call, did you dispatch any responders to his location? Uh, I was leave my partner may have where I was. The calls taken in and going. Okay. And um, may I approach your honor? Always amazing. <laughs> I'm sounding snarky today. I don't mean to be, but it's always amazing how in every trial there's got to be an attorney that says and um. <laughs> it's like you know we got to have some paper flapping. There's got to be a coffer. Okay, we're learning these things now. And there's always got to be one attorney that says, and, um. Ms. Tipke, I'm showing you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 7A. Are you familiar with that exhibit? Yes, I am. And that's a CD or a compact disc, correct? Yes. And are you familiar with the contents of that disc? Yes, sir. And what is that exhibit? It is the CD of the audio call that was taken when he called. So this is the audio of the 911 call that you spoke of? Correct. Have you had a chance to listen to that audio? Yes, I have. Is it true and accurate as you remember it happening on February 2nd, 2021? <laughs> to my knowledge, yes. And I'm going to show you what's been marked as Plaintiff's Exhibit 7B. Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes. And Trans what is 7B? It's a transcribed call on the CD. Okay. And... Um, do you see your initials on the CD? Yes. Do you see your initials on the transcript? Yes. Um, were you able to listen to the audio as you read along with the transcript? Yes. And um, were you able to determine that they are identical? Yes. Is that why you initialed them? Yes. So the transcript is true and accurate like the audio? To my knowledge, yes, it is a match. Your Honor, at this time I move to admit plaintiff 7A and 7B into the record. So prepare your eardrums for a 911 call. And what might sound like a fake cry from this guy, if that's what we're going to hear. You might think I've already heard all of it, but remember when I defluff, I'm very focused on where is the long pauses, where's the lunch break, where's the coffee break. I'm focused on the audio more than I'm actually watching. So, yeah, um, prepare our eardrums. This is witness number 10, by the way. The state said they're going to have between 55 and 60 witnesses or so. So this is Tina Tipke, witness number 10. Okay. So, and Your Honor, I would also like to publish the audio for the jury, and I'd also like to give each of the jury members copies of the transcripts to follow along with as they listen to the audio and for the binders. 
Just what I'm circling his defense attorney because he's like, oh man, he's like getting frustrated here. Like, damn it, this is difficult to listen to now. <laughs> yeah, here's the defendant here, and I've got a picture of the guy on the call, the defendant as well, Daniel Howard, on the screen there. On the right hand side is a picture of the victim.
good thing is we're also going to see some body cam so the performance we've got audio now later we want to have some visual performance viewing as well uh, Kayla says is this the 911 call from when he discovered her dead yep this is the one <laughs> Sorry, the situation is by no means funny. But his call and what he's doing there, like when you just thought it can't get more dramatic, it does. <laughs> just couldn't help but giggling there for a second. I'm like, what on earth? Dude, what a faker, right? In my opinion, <laughs> it sounds like he's faking quite a bit there. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Carla says, I'm officially in my third trimester, so Chris, <laughs> thank you so much. Really appreciate it.
need the trigger bunny for that. Now he's coughing up his ice cream or what? <laughs> oh my. He's really, as someone said, they're laying it on thick. <laughs> and Jeanette says, uh, oh, Barbara said, laying it on thick like butter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Jeanette's like the dog head tilt. So did he just bark? I was gonna say we need like a trigger warning for our pets, you know? It sounds like a yeah, Charles Chapman uh, says it sounds like a dog howling. It does. <laughs> I was thinking if you guys have your pets stay in the room, they're gonna be like, ooh, very soon, you know, joining in. Like, oh my word. <laughs> like that fake teeth breathing that we see so often in cases like this where it's <laughs> like come on dude come on i don't know how long this call goes on for quite a while 
when I was editing the footage, I'm like, damn, like, wait, how long? Because I put this little effect on, you know, with a little audio visualizer. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like, I got to drag it. It goes on for quite a while. You can see body cam too. <laughs> By the way, today's footage was some, it was almost eight hours long and it's four hours 55 that I've uh, defluffed it down to. So just break every now and then because we need a little break here and there. Rob says, how would you transcribe this? <laughs> Imagine, yeah, how would you like to transcribe this? But how would one tra transcribe? It would be like, pen, 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 howl, howl, bark, bark, sob, sob. Okay. <laughs> a little bit of vomit. <laughs> <laughs> See that little fade effect I had there for you, which means okay, I've deep left there, you know, with the one witness leaving and the next one walking to the stand, which also helps. The original was seven hours and 52 minutes, and we've got it down to four hours 55, which is always nice as well. It's one of the benefits of covering the trial a day late versus just, you know, starting two hours late. But I think from next week, we'll just start a little bit later, just cover on the same day. Uh, Dor How do I say your name? Dorothy? 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 Elizabeth? Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. Welcome, everyone. If you're only joining us today, then don't worry. Just check out the description box. There's a whole write-up there for you of what this case is about. You can also watch the first 10 minutes of yesterday's stream or on day one. We also went over a nice little recap there. And otherwise, just uh, join us here. I'm sure you'll catch up in no time. Thank you all for being here. Okay, so that was... Uh, Tina Tipke, retired 911 dispatcher. No questions, no cross-examination, huh? I don't, I don't blame that defense attorney. What's he going to ask? <laughs> okay, yeah, you guys are like, uh, engineers like, we need to sage. <laughs> that was quite something, right? Ryan says, these are noises dogs make when having a nightmare. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, so now we've got the next uh, witness, which would be, uh, is it number 12? Who's counting with me? <laughs> Does anyone even care? I don't know. I always count. Um, this will now be number 11, witness number 11. Okay. Uh, Miranda Thomas and T-H-O-M-A-S. How are you employed? I'm a patrol deputy with the Kootenai County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been 
almost four years. And are you closer to five? Yes. And in Idaho, that means what? I have full arrest powers in Idaho. Back in February, specifically February 2nd, uh, 2021, you were working as a patrol deputy in the Sheriff's Department. Yes, sir. How, how new of a patrol deputy were you back then? In patrol, I had only swapped over in August of 2020. So, pretty much brand new? Mm hmm on um, that particular evening, what was your shift? Graveyards. Okay, and was that on your left? At the time, they were 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. At some point when you dispatched out to uh, residents in Apple, Cookie County, Idaho. Yes. What time was that? Around 10 to 11 at night. I don't know the exact time. What was the name? Quick pause. Um, so, Yaya said, Gee, did I hear you say she shot herself in the mouth? Being a law enforcement officer, he should have known that a woman most likely would not shoot themselves in the mouth. Yeah, that's what he's going for, is that she took her purse to the bathroom, made herself a bubble bath, and got in the tub and then shot herself in the mouth. Wow, YouTube's going to love that phrase, aren't they? They're going to be like, that's it. So please, please like and share so that others can know we are live because some people don't know because, you know, I'm saying all the naughty words there. But yes, indeed, that's what he wants people to believe is that she got in the bath and shot herself in the mouth. Like, look at this guy. Okay. It was aired as a suicide attempt. How long did it take you to get there? About 20 minutes. Did you want to talk by yourself? Yes. When you got there, were other deputies still arriving? Yes. Did you wait for a while? Yes. And what was the purpose of that? Uh, we all decided that we were going to go in together due to the nature of the call because there was a gun involved and whatnot. To... So, how many, sorry, can you just pull that microphone a little closer to you and try to speak with you? How about that? That's better, thank you. Approximately, how many deputies then um, gathered before going to that residence? Four deputies and a sergeant. Okay. You remember the address that you responded to? I don't remember the numerics, but I remember the street. Wheat Ridge, off of Highway 54. Where did you all park or stage before you walk to the residence? Just east of that room, uh, pulled over on the north side. Okay. Describe what you could see and or hear as you approached the residence. As we were driving up, we couldn't see or hear I anything. Mean, I mean, once you got on foot after the car. Uh, we saw a mail exit the front door of the house screaming. Okay. What was he screaming? Oh my god, just. Some of it was in our corner and we were just moaning and screaming. Did you later identify him? Yeah. Moaning, screaming, a little bit of barking. Yes. Daniel Howard. Is he here today? Yes. Can you just point out to try to receive it? Yes, he did. To your left, my gray suit. Thank you. What was um, the nature of your duties that day? I, for the majority of it, sat with. Dan, as he introduced himself. Okay. At, at one point, did you go into the house? Yes. Did you make any notations on your inside of the house? Did you know anything? Yes. What was that? Uh, when I walked downstairs, I found a packed Victoria's Secret double bag. I noted that one of the washing machines was running. And we walked through and noticed that all the sinks were dry. Was it the washer running or the dryer? I believe it was the washer. It was the one on the left, if you look in the room from the doorway. And we know from yesterday the defense attorney's like, oh, she packed a Victoria's Secret bag. Okay, and your point is, I wouldn't doubt if he's going to ask questions about that. <laughs> One of those things was when you got there? Yes. Did you, was the Victoria's Secret bag open or closed? Open. Could you see your contents? Yeah, it appeared to be when it was closed. Did you appear to be packed? Yes. Did, was the nature of your assignment that you need to watch be with Mr. Howard outside as well as later inside the room? Yes. And so were you able to know his behavior outside as well as inside? Yes. Can you describe his behavior? Outside he was uh, moaning and yelling. He would scream, oh my God, he would ask what was going on, what were we doing? Um, he would gag every so often and hold his knees, bend over in distress, or um, moan as if he was crying. But inside he was more angry than upset. What do you mean by that?
very interesting statements there. <laughs> you know, he was um, basically pretending to cry, like it made it look like he was crying, but he seemed more angry, like, oh, okay, yeah. He was angry with us for not allowing his son to come to the house. He was slamming his fist on the counter. Did he cover his face up with his hands at times? Yes. I'm sorry? Leaving the door. Over. How, how often? Very often. Could you see when he was making these bullying noises when he was acting in behavior that he describes as whether or not he had actual tears? At no point did I observe any tears throughout the night. At one point in the evening, did you take note of the shirt that he was wearing? Yes. What caught your attention? Uh, there appeared to be deodorant marks on his shirt. And why did that get your attention? Because by that time it was almost midnight. And most people, if you put your clothes on in the morning and get the other on them, it's gone by midnight. Were you wearing body cam at you? Yes, sir. And did that capture your contact with Mr. Howard outside the residence? Yes, sir. As well as inside the residence? I believe so. Let me show you a couple of exhibits that have been marked already. for the next performance here we go with body cam yeah i like this uh, deputy this patrol deputy is like uh he was like bending over gagging pretending to cry but there were no tears <laughs> yeah she could see what's going on here
know you're retired, right? Okay. I'll, I'll have your time Okay. What's going on? Sir, they have to do their job. Damn, his voice just changed there, huh? She's like, uh, she said, I know you're retired. And then he said something about, no, I'm not retired. Well, I don't know what he said. Wow. Okay. And then he's like, okay, performance back on. <laughs> Here we go. I know we can't see very well. Of course, this is from the courtroom TV. Of course, you know, I've tried to sharpen it as best I can, but you know, it's not, it's not great quality, but it, <laughs> we can, we can definitely get what's going on here. What is it? They're going to hold the scene in there. I don't going to go in there. There was the hell. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Don't you love it? They're all just standing there like, like kind of like, what do we do now? Like, oh my word, just observing. Because of course, you know, he's uh, buying himself some time here with all these performance, just making as if he can't talk. He just can't talk. He can't answer any questions right now. <laughs> sure. <laughs>
he's just like, what's going on? I think I know, goddammit. Okay. <laughs> and they just all stare at him like, all right then. They don't even have to say, let us know when it's out of your system, right? Steel guitar, they don't even have to. They're just looking at him like, yeah, let us know when you're done with whatever that is. Jenna says, pity we can't see the jury's faces. I'm sure they're all staring at him in the courtroom, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't imagine all of them looking at him like, really, dude? <laughs> was February 2nd of 2021 it took until April of 2023 for them to have an arrest warrant for him and after a two-year investigation 
And so he was arrested officially on April 21st of 2023. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So you said you met with uh, a group of officers prior to responding to the house? Yes. And where was that at? Where was that at? Just east of the residence on Highway 54, parked on the north side. And at that time, did you uh, become aware of a prior uh, response to that residence a few days? Yes. And were you aware that uh, Ms. Howard had left the residence? No. So you don't know about A, whether it was coming or going? Correct. Do um, you know uh, when Anne had taken a shower last? No. Do you know if it was uh, eight or nine shifts? No. And you said that at this point you had just finished. Uh, when did you finish your um, post? Like the academy? Yes. June of the year before. And then there's a process where you do training where you're with officers? Yes. And when did you finish your? January of 2021. Okay. And uh, in that, would you agree uh, that I do have previously met Ann before? No. Have you ever had an encounter to be how you guys express mm -hmm. or shop? No. Can you read her? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Let me step up. Thank you. Jack Sifford is next. Okay. Sir, can you say your whole name and spell your last name? <laughs> it's like, did you ever meet him before? Nope. I like her face. It's kind of snarky, right? She's like, mm -hmm, never met him before. Probably doesn't want to meet him again. <laughs> okay, so now we've got the next witness, which is witness number 12. Okay, throughout the trial, not for the day, for the, for, I'm counting from when the first witness was on the stand. Sure. Zachary Sifford, S-I-F-F-O-R-D. How are you currently employed? Uh, with the Kitty County Sheriff's Office. What do you do there? I'm a patrol lieutenant. How long have you been with the Sheriff's Department? Uh, since 2015. As a patrol lieutenant, where are your duties? Uh, on administrative uh, duties for the patrol division, scheduling. Are you certified? Yes, sir. Uh, advanced. Were you working on February 2nd of 2021? I was. What was your rank then? I was a patrol sergeant. What were your duties then? Uh, I led a shift, I led a graveyard shift at the time, so between four to six deputies. At some point on the evening of February 2nd, 2021, did you and a group of deputies respond to the Howard residence in Apple, Idaho? Yes, it did. At what time was this? Um, I'd have to look at the, it was late in the evening. Uh, we just come on to shift, so uh, it would be late evening hours. When you got to the Howard residence, did the group of you wait until everybody was assembled? We did, yes. So it was you and about how many deputies? I think total there was probably five, maybe six. Okay. And did you guys approach the residence? We did, yes. At some point, um, who you granted entry into the residence? Yes. By who? The deputies had entered the residence upon my arrival. When I got there, they'd already been inside. Okay. Did you take steps to make sure that the scene was secure in terms of the house, Kendi's body, any potential evidence? Yes, we did. How did you take those steps? Well, we entered the house and we cleared the house. We also had deputies positioned at, um, in the driveway and alongside the house in case folks were to show up. We could keep everybody away. And did that include any family members of the house? That's correct. Was that to keep the scene secure until the detectives could get a search warrant and conduct an investigation? Yes. And to your knowledge, did that take place? Was the scene kept secure? Yes. Did you yourself um, remain at the scene for a period of time? I did, yes. About how long? Um, I'd say I was, I was there several hours. I was there after the detectives began their investigation with them. During that several hours, were you able to observe Dan Howard? Yes. Dan Howard here today? Yes. Can you please point him out, describe where he's seated, tell us what he's wearing? 
your left. Next is attorney dressed in a gray oh. coat. Yes, sir. In your observation of Mr. Howard there at his home, did anything get your attention? Uh, yes. What was that? His demeanor and um, just his overall uh, attitude, I would say. What about his demeanor caught your attention? The demeanor was um, well, different to me because there was, <clears throat> we spent a lot of time, we wanted to make sure we were comfortable as deputies, um, offering us coffee or food, um, and constantly offering us something which just was kind of strange as um, Katie's body was in plain sight and it was just a, it didn't seem organic, it didn't seem the right sight. Did you? Oh my word, he's like, any tea, coffee, anyone? Hmm? You want a snack? Can I get you guys anything? We're friends now. <laughs> that must be so awkward after that whole performance. Oh my word. They all took note of his demeanor that night. Like, what the hell is this? And they're like, Kendi's body was in plain sight and this guy's offering us tea and coffee all day long. Wow. Ever observed him covering his face and making noises that suggested he was in grief? Um, he was making noises, yes. Have you ever seen any actual tears? No, you not. Have you made any suicides in your career? Yes. Approximately how many? Ballpark 100. And based on your experience, was there anything unusual about this alleged suicide? Yes. Um, typically, um, there's a lot of care and dignity for the loved one, for the body. Um, and that was not the case in this event. What do you mean? Uh, typically, family members will uh, beg us for a pillow or a um, sheet or something to cover the body um, or to make them more comfortable. Um, in this case, the female was naked, um, exposed, um, and there were a lot of deputies and personnel going in and out, and there just didn't seem to be any care for the dignity of the body. I was going to say, is there going to be cross-examination? What are they going to ask him? Wow, that is shocking. If his wife was dead in the bathtub, so naked, and had apparently been shot in her mouth. He wants people to believe she shot herself in the mouth. Wow. He's just putting on this performance, offering tea and coffee, and not even caring about covering her up or asking, can we cover her up or anything like that. Wow. Good morning. So, I did previously that Mr. Howard. No. Um, you're aware that he's former patrol. Yes. And you, you're aware that he's a patrol officer. Yes. And I don't like the time there. Yes. And like in your experience, you would assume that he also has responded to the teens. Yes. Okay. So. Um, are you, do you know whether or not uh, officers told him when they arrived that they need to do their thing? I would imagine we would tell him that. He would understand that more than most of the people that you're responding to, correct? Judge, that calls into um, potential speculation into counsel's client's name. I'm going to overrule. It's fair cross based on the on the direct. Can you be it, sir? He would be based on his experience. When told something like that, he would be in a position to understand that law enforcement has to do their thing, correct? Yeah. I believe that's possible. Yes. And so he's differently situated than many of the suicides that you respond to. Sure. Judge, that calls for speculation as well. Are you? You don't know the state of mind on that day, correct? I do not. Law enforcement was there. They were there. Do you know what time they cleared? No, sir. It was many hours, correct? Many hours, yes. Um, and so in that time, you're saying that within many hours, he offered to get you food and water? Is water, something to eat, coffee? Over the course of many hours. More towards the beginning of the contact. Thank you, sir.
sorry, that obviously has appeared. Yeah, now we've got the next witness. Damn, I'm still, I'm so shocked that Daniel Howard was like, anyone, anyway, water, snacks, coffee, tea. Can I get you something? I'm, I'm surprised he didn't offer them an, a drink, like from his bar. Like, so shall we all have some shots or what? Sure. That's just terrible. Also, this is his uh, private attorney from what we learned yesterday. We were all wondering, is this now a public defender, private defender, apparently a private attorney. They are, he's paying for, so there's only one of them. You know, sometimes when there's public defenders and it's a murder trial, you might see two or three. But yeah, there's only this one guy here. Is that a report or something? It is. I noticed you placed the case down. Yes, sir. All right. That's fine. Just let us know if you need to refer to it so that we know if you're referring to it or not. Okay. You may have one. Thank you. Can you say how many of you us? Benjamin Wheeler, W-H-E-E-L-E-R. How are you employed? Uh, as a deputy for Putin County Sheriff's Office. How long have you been so uh, Approximately four years. I assume that you've gone through high hopes. Yes, sir. Back on February 2nd, 2021, were you working? Yes, I was. How new of a deputy were you? Very new. Were you still in field training? I was. What does that mean? Uh, it's uh, about 14 weeks worth of on the job training with a field training officer. I was in week five or six. So, kind of halfway through it? Yes. Correct. Who was your field training officer on February 2nd, 2021? Uh, former Deputy Nye. So Deputy Nye no longer works for the Sheriff's Department? He does not. On that date, February 2nd, 2021, in the evening hours, did you get dispatched along with Deputy Nye to the Howard residence in Appalachia? Yes. And did you and other deputies uh, wait until everyone from the law enforcement perspective? We did. We well, there was a group of us that gathered before going to the residence. As you walked up to the residence, did anything catch your attention? Uh, yes, that the garage door was open. There was a dog in the garage, and I didn't really hear much of any sound walking up to the house. Did you go into the house via the garage or another way? Into the house through the front door. Did anyone let you in or invite you in? Uh, Mr. Howard met me at the front door. Yes. Ooh, let's hear all about that interaction. Sebastian said uh, nobody, especially women, take their own life naked. And we'd heard that Kendi was um, self-conscious, you know, about her body. And she was signing up to have a, what they call a mommy makeover, which was a tummy tuck and a breast augmentation and all that. So the whole situation is just bizarre to think that that's what Daniel Howard thinks a taking one's own life would look like. Like take her purse to the bathroom, run herself a bath, get in the bath and then shoot herself in the mouth and be found naked like that? Mm -mm. I don't think so. So that's also not very believable, right? Okay, thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. If you're only joining now or if you could just pop in and out today, really appreciate it. It's always nice to have you here. Wherever you go, take us with you. And if you can't, we'll save you a seat, okay? And if things get too much for you, just know you can come back anytime. Your seat will be saved. Is he here today? Uh, yes, he is. Can you please point him out and describe where he's seated? Tell us what he's wearing. Uh, he's seated to the left of you. Looks like a uh, gray suit coat, purple shirt. What was uh, initially the behavior of Mr. Howard when you arrived there? Uh, he was very upset and distraught, um, being very loud. Okay. Did you and other deputies um, go into the house and assess the situation? Yes. What was your job pursuant to your training officer? My job was to go and find uh, the victim and assess the situation before medical could come in. I just want to answer that question that someone asked earlier. Sorry, I didn't see now exactly who it was, but you were saying, why did it take so long, you know, to investigate this as a murder? They were investigating for those two years, but the thing is the coroner initially said that um, this was an undetermined death. And they refer to it in opening statements as short timers syndrome. They were like short timers syndrome, which Uncle Google tells us is a passive aggressive version of take this job and shove it. So the coroner who initially ruled this death as undetermined was getting ready to retire. He'd, you know, lost his passion or something. So he was also investigated, that coroner, for 14 other 
rulings he made on death, which should have been something else other than undetermined. He seemed to just be like, ah, okay, yeah, undetermined, whatever. Not not really interested in his job anymore, right? Which is why they said he's got a short time as syndrome. But later, because of all the investigators, because of all the observations they made, there were other um, medical examiners, coroners, forensic pathologists that, of course, came on board and had studied all the evidence. And they're like, this is not undetermined. And it's also not her taking her own life. This was a homicide is what they then ruled. And we're going to hear from some of them today as well. Um, some medical experts, not that original one, right? Yeah. Yes. Can you describe what happened? Uh, I initially talked to Mr. Howard outside the front door, and then I walked past him into the house, looked around the living room, didn't see her, and I, I didn't remember exactly where she was supposed to be, so I went back out and asked Mr. Howard where uh, his wife was, and she, he said that she was in the bathtub upstairs, and so then I went back to upstairs and found her. In the, uh, so this was Deputy With Deputy Yes. And can you describe what you saw in the bathroom? I saw a woman naked in the bathtub with an apparent gunshot wound. Um, there was blood around her coming out of her mouth. Anything else you could observe in the bathtub besides her? Uh, yes, there was a gun laying to the, on, to the right of her in the water, and there was the, the water was tinted red. Okay. Could you see the gun through the water at the bottom of the tub? Yes. Did you see, did you mention you saw a shell casing as well? No. Um, I don't recall. Okay. From there, what did you do? Uh, once uh, her pulse was checked, no pulse was found by Deputy Nye, called for a medical, and then they came in and announced that she was deceased. And then we cleared the residence upstairs to make sure no one else was in the house. And then I uh, stood by. Okay. At some point, did you talk to Mr. Howard after you observed his wife dead upstairs in the bathroom? I did. Just a quick pause there. Uh, Beach Mom said, did she have anything in toxicology? He must have sedated her to get the gun in place. The thing is that they said because he was a former Marine and he also was a former Idaho State Police trooper, he had lots of training. He was an ISP trooper for more than for about 20 years, they said. I think the exact number was 19 years, but in the opening statement, so they said about 20 years. And so they referred to this carotid restraint technique. Um, and apparently the coroners that actually did their job properly said that she was asphyxiated. She died from asphyxiation, which is so scary to think that he would have used techniques. I'm speculating based on what we've heard that he would have um, plausibly used techniques that he learned um, when he was in the Marines or at his job, this carotid uh, restraint technique asphyxiated her. That's how she died. Then undressed her, ran a bath, put her in the bath and then shoot her in the mouth and make it look like she did it to herself. Oh my goodness. And remember, yesterday we heard from um, former friends that he had joked after drinking quite a bit that, you know, and had joked a few times, they said, that he could make a uh, murder look like a suicide. So that was very interesting to hear as well. Where did this take place? Out in the front yard, outside the front door. And what was that contact all about? Uh, I was trying to get a timeline from Mr. Howard when he had last seen his wife okay. and let him know that she was deceased. Were you at some point after that assigned the duty of taking photographs? Yes. Who gave you that duty? Uh, I believe it was Deputy Knight. And did you end up taking photographs? I did. Let me show you a group of photographs that were marked as 16A through 16N. I'm just going to show them to you and then flip them down briefly, okay? Mm -hmm. You recognize 16A through 16N? I do. How do you recognize those two? Photos that I took. Would those photos include? Step into the carrier, and we'll call the well, and we'll take some photographs. Can you 
tell us where you're at what it shows. I'm standing just inside the front door area, and that's photographed of the stairway leading up to the bathroom and then down to the basement. So basically you're in the living room? Yes. 16B? That's just a, another photograph of the stairs going up to the bathroom. See? That's a photograph from the stairway into the bathroom where Kendi is. Can you see the top of Kendi's hair? Yes, right there next to the hair. Next to the bottle is the chamber of the commission. And then, uh, e? that show? That's a photograph of the inside of the bathroom, including Kendi in the bathtub, and a person phone on the counter. And your glasses as well are on the counter? Yes. Are those items your purse? Her glasses, her phone, are they able to in arm's reach of the bathtub? Uh, no, it would be difficult to grab those from where the bathtub is. 16. And that's just a, another photograph of the whole counter showing the side of the previous photo. That's a photograph, another angle showing the tower rack and then Kendi in the bathtub. So, with 16 F and the next one, 16 G, have Kendi's body been moved in any fashion whatsoever? No. This is just how um, she was when you got there? Yes. 16 G. And that's just a view from up top overall of Kendi. So, are those bubbles there um, in the lower half of the photograph? Yes, they are. And what about the water temperature? Did you put your hand in there and see how warm that water was? I don't remember if I put my hand in there, but I, I'm fairly certain I put my hand above the water and felt that it was still warm. And that's a photograph of the firearm next to her in the water. Uh, that's a photograph of the stairway leading down into the basement. 16J. Uh, that's a photograph in the basement, uh, I believe right outside the uh, laundry room, with the uh, inside the partially packed bag in the vacuum cleaner. So basically the stairs going down. Yes. Lead to this area right here. Correct. 16 feet. What's that? That is a photograph of a folder on the counter, the bar counter downstairs. Uh, it appears to be from an attorney's office at law, as it says. Okay. And then 16 L. That's a photograph I took of a handwritten set of assets that appear to be with kind of split. Where was that in relationship to the attorney documents we saw in the proceeding? It was next to it on the counter, on the bar counter. Okay. Last one of yours I have is 16M. What else with that is? Uh, that's a photograph of the washer and dryer. And Wait. I believe it was the dryer showing that it still had time left on it and it was going. Now was my next question is which is which? I believe the dryer was on the left. The dryer on the left um, has a six there, a digital six is a screen. What's that? Uh, that's showing the, the time that's left in that cycle, I believe. So when you walk downstairs, after talking to you, Mr. Howard, after viewing Kennedy, after getting your camera, that dryer still has six minutes to go? Yes. How long had you been there? At that point, by the time the dryer, when you took a photograph, had six minutes to go? Um, I don't recall exactly. I would say maybe 30 minutes. Does the photo have a timestamp on it? We'll get that evidence out to other people that they can. I'm interested, though, were there things inside the dryer? Yes. Okay. And did you ever look inside it, or was that another deputy detective? Uh, I looked. Into it, and what did you see? I can see that there was clothing, appeared to be bath towels, and possibly uh, a bedroom or a bathroom. 
So the period you did bath towels and bath ropes were drying in the dryer about a half hour after you got there and the dryer was still running? Yes. Okay. You can take your seat. <clears throat> Have a look at this performance. Uh, yes, 
sorry. I'm just very careful, very unlike, just in case, just in case. I also didn't catch anything. You know, they they just here and they go panning into the bathroom. I just hope they don't show anything graphic. So. how his voice changes just like that just like oh there's the number you know just saying the number in like this deep voice but then back to oh no like okay is there anyone else that you'd like me to call or you want me to just get a little wide <laughs> was a cop for like 20 years didn't think he heard a gunshot he thought it was a thud you know so like something hit the floor is what he thought he heard wow sure okay i don't know okay. i really don't know i believe it happened it's it's about 11 15. Uh, maybe 9 30. 9 30 or so
here's this uh, witness we saw the deputy thomas miranda thomas she's just looking at him like okay let's hope youtube doesn't pick up on this music that's playing on the background either because then they're gonna not like that so let's hope that that's fine some of those shut down streams if they pick up music like oh you're playing music from somewhere so just talk a bit in between I like how all of them are just observing him, like standing there watching, like what? worried about himself there isn't he <laughs> 701 says I like that song too thanks Dan Andrew says he's probably exhausted from his performance right yeah that's right Woody he's hiding that there's no tears Look how they're showing us all this. There's not much going on, but it's still interesting to watch. Like, oh, feels like forever. He's just sitting there crying for himself. Fake crying. Not, not really crying. <laughs> He's crying. <laughs>
I bet if they ask, can we tuck you in? He'll be like, okay. Can we make sure you're comfortable? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, look at the camera, sir. It reminds me almost like when a kid, you know, if a kid falls or scrapes their knee, everything's fine. But then when they look around and see if somebody's watching them, then suddenly it's like... Because <laughs> he just like... He just looked up a little bit, then he's like, oh, they're still watching. Okay, okay. Performance is still on. <laughs> I think he thinks it's nap time now. <laughs> Ashley's like, next up on the country top 100 list. And he's like, I'm going to do nap time now, guys. Right.
Nap time, Purple Haze. This one doing a nap. Sleepy time. He's exhausted. This performance has gone on for so long. He says barking boy means he's nappy. <laughs> How awkward to be standing there in the room, right? With the body cam on, just standing there watching him. Shame, poor Miranda Thomas. Thompson? Hold on. Miranda Thomas. She's the deputy standing there in the room, like. still chicks are they still watching oh, okay no they still are damn it all right performance continues See, there's no tears. I think that's what it's proving as well. You can see that he's like, <laughs> but there's, there's no actual waterworks. This music. I'm saying this music because it's dangerous for YouTube. <laughs> they mustn't shut the stream down. Don't do that, YouTube. I don't mean to play the music, okay? Let's speed it up a little bit. 
Thank goodness. Yes. That was nice, right? <laughs> Teleporting right through that mid-morning break. Off we go. So now they're back. They took, you know, five, ten minute break. Here they are. Yes. Had various parts of your taking photographs of your dad. Yes. And had essentially the lengthy time that you spent waiting for detectives to get there with the search warrant had some of that been redacted. Yes. What we watched there showed uh, Mr. Howard with his hands over, the face, over his face most of the time. Was that consistent with basically the entire time you were there when he was inside sitting at that school? It was. Did you ever at any time whether outside with Mr. Howard or inside, or he was seated at that bar with his hands on his face and seen the tears? I did not. We've got one more video to show you. It's been marked as 10 ready for more body cam <laughs> we're gonna hear more of that and all of that so maurice australia thank you so much oh my goodness you said happy 40th birthday g thank you and then what's what's 9.3 what's that <laughs> oh 9th of the third that's right for the 9th of march uh wishing you every happiness and prosperity always thank, thank you so much this message is so sweet i'm gonna read it the whole thing again later wow thank you very much i really appreciate it yeah, birthday's on Saturday. <laughs> to all the replay watchers from the future, I'm so sorry about that. If you're watching like in, I don't know, maybe they're watching in 2025 and they're like, oh my word, yes, we know it's your birthday. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, let's watch this. Oh. Oh, you can see his ear, everyone. See that? Maybe I should whisper something in it. Elwap. You hear that, sir? Elwap. Ah, oh, okay.
such a crazy scene with all this music going. I mean, I don't know. Even if people just delivered furniture to my house, I'd be like, damn, if the music was blasting like that, I'd be like, ooh, I'm so sorry, turn that off. Like, in this scenario, he's just letting this music play like that. It's weird. <laughs> Isn't it a bit strange? Given the situation. Like, wow, bro, read the room. Prior to 
Uh, we grouped up together and then went to the residence. At that meeting, were you aware of law enforcement call from the Phoenix car? I don't recall. So we have witness number 14, Glenn Acevedo, I think they said. Let's just hear how she spelled it again. You can please state your full name and spell your last name for the record. Lynette K. Acevedo, A-C-E-B-E-D-O. Lynn, how do you feel this morning? Not great. <laughs> Is that why you're wearing a mask? Yes. Okay. I'm going to ask you to slide that mic just a little bit closer to you. Make sure you speak nice and clear and slow, okay? Okay. <clears throat> what is your occupation? I'm the Chief Deputy Coroner of Kootenai County. How long have you been in that position? Since 2015. What exactly is a coroner? Uh, as in, what do we do? Sure. Okay. We respond, or we, um... <clears throat> Our calls to unattended deaths, um, anything medical, traffic, homicides, suicides, accidents, uh, and natural disease processes. Is that essentially what a deputy coroner would do as well? Yes. Chief deputy coroner? Yes. Do you hold any special um, training to perform that job? I do. Um, I am also an American Board Medical Legal Death Investigator. Can you briefly describe what training is involved for a death investigator? We go through all kinds of training um, from natural disease processes, working with um, several agencies, uh, blood spatter patterns, uh, injury patterns, um, any and all aspects of death. Do you participate in, in ongoing training throughout your years as a chief deputy coroner um, to Stay up to date in your field. Yes. And is there a, a difference between a death investigator and a coroner? Um, it varies in county to county and state to state in what training they have. Does a coroner have more training than a death investigator? The coroner um, has several different backgrounds they can run from medical doctors to plumbers. Okay. <laughs> to a plumber. Is the, does the coroner take any role in um, issuing official documents? We do. Can you describe that process? We issue death certificates. And that death certificate includes certain types of information? It does. Is there a process by which the coroner, um, just generally speaking, fills out that death certificate form? Yes. Can you describe that? Um, anytime a doctor will not sign a death certificate, um, either they don't feel comfortable signing it, even if it's their patient, uh, the coroner's office can be assigned to sign that death certificate. And in any case that is not a natural death, the coroner's office does sign all death certificates. Why do coroners investigate unattended deaths? To make sure that there is nothing suspicious, nothing, no trauma, nothing, nothing other than a natural disease process that occurred. In your career, how many deaths have you attended? Thousands. And would that be attended as well as unattended deaths? Yes. Would that be natural causes? Yes. Accidents? Yes. Suicides? Yes. And homicides? Yes. How does 
does your role intersect with law enforcement? We're 100% connected. We typically work side by side. If there is a call for an unattended death, does law enforcement reach out to you? They do. And do you respond to death scenes? Yes. When you were there, did you conduct your own investigation? Yes. Can you describe generally what you would do um, if you responded to an unattended death? Um, initially, we would get a call from dispatch and or a detective um, letting us know where we're going. We would um, go get to the scene. We would approach the first officer or deputy on the scene. Uh, and we then would go to our detective um, and process the scene with them. Um, or sometimes it's after they've been there for a while. Uh, we would process the scene, take our photos, uh, call the funeral home, get them processed for transport to a funeral home. Are, do you also assist in transporting bodies for autopsy? Yes. And what is an autopsy? It's a complete full forensic examination of the body um, inside and out. Who decides whether a body in an unattended death is sent for autopsy? We do, the coroner's office. What is the point of sending a body for autopsy? There are sometimes injuries and or um, natural disease process inside bodies that we cannot see. So we want to make sure that we're documenting any and all injuries and or illnesses. Is it always necessary to have an autopsy in cases of unattended deaths? No. Can you give me an example? Um, if an uh, elderly person is at their residence and they pass away from a natural disease process, uh, we will not send for an autopsy. If somebody falls down and hits their head, uh, we would send for an autopsy to see what kind of injuries they sustain, whether it would be from their head to their chest. Um, if people are young and sick at home, uh, you know, young people shouldn't be dying at home, so we'll send because of an age. Um, we send all car crashes, we send suicides, depending on wound tracks, and we send all homicides, or potential homicides. Who performs autopsies? Forensic pathologists. Does Kootenai County currently employ a forensic pathologist? We do not. Who does Kootenai County utilize for autopsies? The Spokane Medical Examiner's Office. And do you facilitate in getting those bodies to the Spokane County Medical Examiner? Yes. Is it common for you to see bodies after they have been at the Spokane County Medical Examiner's Office? Yes. Can you tell me what circumstances would allow you to see a body after autopsy? Uh, they get returned to a funeral home of, a, of choosing, um, and we're often there on another case, following up on another case. Um, sometimes we'll go back and look at bodies just as part of our ending process. Do you receive um, information from the Spokane County Medical Examiner um, as part of your investigation? Uh, a total case, yes. Once it's finished, yes, we get a full report. Do you also receive information from law enforcement? We do. Push your approach to witness. Manner of death in Kootenai County? The coroner. And is that the 
determination made based on the various sources of information and investigation that you just described. Yes. Is a manner of death determined by the coroner in unattended death cases. Yes. Is that different from cause of death? It's a totality of cause of death. In the, I think you said thousands of deaths that you have attended, um, are you able to ballpark for me how many of them have been suicides? Oh gosh, um, hundreds, probably between three and five hundred. Can you ballpark for me how many have been homicides? Mm, I'd say less than twenty. that the coroner um, does their investigation and makes a death determination. Can that death determination ever be changed? Yes. What would cause a coroner's death determination to change? Um, new insight into a case, whether, um, whether new investigations were done, new evidence was found, um, things of that nature. Does undetermined as the manner of death, um, would that be the category that is most frequently changed? Yes. And would that be because that is changed to one of the other four manners of death? Yes. Were you employed on February 2nd of 2021? Yes. Were you chief deputy coroner at that time? Yes. Did you respond to the unattended death of an individual by the name of Kenny Howard? Yes. How long after law enforcement arrived did you arrive? It was several hours after. When you arrived, um, can you just sort of briefly describe the scene that you walked into? Um, I entered the residence um, into a living room area and was directed to an upstairs bathroom area and bedroom. Who was present at the home at that time? Um, Dan Howard um, and law enforcement. Did you have any interactions with Dan Howard? No. Was he pointed out to you by law enforcement? No. When you um, were directed upstairs, what did you do next? Uh, I did a complete walkthrough of the area that I was um, going to be investigating and started taking photos shortly after. Um, of the entire scene. Why would a coroner take photos of areas of the house that did not have a body in it? It's part of the overall investigation that we do. Um, with scene investigations on our side, we're looking at things differently than law enforcement in a lot of ways. Um, there's there's just different investigative skills that we have, that we share with law enforcement, that, that we're just looking at things differently. Then I'm going to approach you with what has been marked as states 17G Zoom, 17J, 17I, 17H, and 17G. And again, I'm just going to kind of flip through these photos for you. You know, if you want me to go slower. <coughs> do you recognize these photos? I do. What do you recognize them to be? My photos. And are these photos of the house before you took photos of the body? Yes. And as far as 17G Zoom goes, and 17G just by itself, is 17G Zoom a zoomed in portion of 17G? Yes. Move to admit 17G, H, I, J, and 17G, Zoom. Any objection? Those will be admitted. Okay, Lynn, I'm going to start you off with 17G. There will be quite a jump cut here because I edited out the one picture that they showed accidentally of the victim's top half 
naked in the bath. So just so you know. master bedroom. Was there something about this part of the master bedroom that caught your attention? Um, no, it's just an overall at first. Okay. Seventeenth I. Why did you take this picture? Um, in this particular picture there's I don't know if you can see them, but there's little tiny shards of glass on the carpet. And 17H. It's a closer um, up photo, a close up photo of the carpet with the glass. Did you also document where the body is located? I did. Where was the body located? In the bathtub, in the upstairs bathroom. Can you describe for me what you observed when you walked in that bathroom? I observed um, a clean bathroom. It was very clean. It was, um, the, there was a, a purse on the counter. There was a cell phone on the counter. Um, and there was um, a female laying in the bathroom. Did you document what you observed in that bathroom as you documented other parts of the house? Yes. Uh, permission to approach? Okay. Okay, then I'm going to put those there for just a second. I'm going to show you what's been marked as 17 A, B, C, D, E, and F. I'm going to put these. Do you recognize these photos? Yes. What do you recognize them to be? Those are my photos. Do these, are these accurate photographs that you took? Yes. Do they clearly depict the scene as you observed it that night? Yes. Do to admit 17A through F? No objection. 17A through F are intended. Do to publish? You may publish them. And then what observations did you make initially about Kenny Howard? Um, it just seems abnormal. The the way her body is in the bathtub appears abnormal to me. I'm going to show you 17D. And as I'm doing that, if you would elaborate on what you felt was abnormal about the positioning. So in this picture, um, one of the things that kind of struck me is that her hair is across her face, which uh, she, she pulls her hair up to take a bath. It is in a clip, and so why would she? Judge, I can ask the to rephrase that, I think. Okay. I'm just going to pause. Uh, Lizbeth says a virtual eyes now if you are squeamish. Nope, we don't show anything like that on this channel. Definitely not on purpose. Like I try my best to edit that out to not show it if they ever do show autopsy pictures and things. Even if people want to be like, this is true crime, man. No, we're here to respect the victims and their families. We're not coroners, so we don't have to see that. Um, so I won't be showing that. And as I say, I've edited out the one slide that they showed of the victim's body in the bathtub. It was quite a close-up as well. So that one is no longer in my stream. It's probably out there on the original stream somewhere. Um, Barbara said this case is for justice for Kendi Howard. Yes, it is indeed. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Marilyn says the law is innocent until proven guilty, isn't it? It is, but we are allowed to have our opinions. I'm not sure who you're saying it to, but we are not the jury. We are not the judge. We are not deciding on this case, so we can have opinions. In my opinion, he's very, very guilty. And from everything I've heard, I'm like, whew, this guy, Elwop for him, huh? <laughs> but let's see what the jury decides. Uh, this trial is set to last about three weeks. They said about 15 court days, so that's why they say three weeks. It started this week, of course. So we've still got two more weeks uh, together from next week. Um, and hopefully on those days, I'll be caught up, you know, to cover the trial live on the day, but with a little bit of a delay so we can still skip over the breaks and lunches and things. Unless, of course, you prefer it this way. We're still deciding, but I think that's the plan. 
So if you have never heard of this case before, welcome. Please check out the description box. There's a whole write-up I've done there for you. You can also check out the first 10 minutes of day two stream or the first 15 minutes or so of day one stream because we went over like a good recap of the case. Um, but the easiest way now is just click more on the description box. It'll expand it for you. Just quickly read that and you should know what it's about. Okay, so let's continue listening to this chief deputy coroner. The very last part of the phrase, um, the last part of the question. Okay. So the answer was that it kind of struck her as odd because the hair was brushing face. That's fine. The part about uh, precisely what she did to take a bath was speculation. So I'll strike that part. Were you able to observe whether or not Kenny Howard's hair was up or down? Yes. Was it up or down? Up. Was there something holding it up? I can't tell what it is. Were you able to observe it that night? That it's up? Was there, oh. that there was something in her hair? I did not know. Okay. Um, was there hair that was not being held up? Yes. And that's what struck you as odd? Yes. Okay. Was there anything about the bath water that struck you as odd? It, um, it didn't seem blood tinged enough for a bullet. Objection foundation. 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 Objection foundation
be a blood expert or discuss lines or that they coordinate with medical examiners, law enforcement, or basically they have a role. But they don't have the experience of medical professionals to give expert opinions on blood lines, blood loss, all that. Um, the, here we have a social degree with a medical certificate. That is not proper foundation. So it's uh, conversations outside of the presence of the jury right now. Yeah, Eddie says court audio just went to the lefty only. I know, right? Oh, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> and it's all boosted, but sometimes it's in one year, then it's the other. It's just like, come on, man. Okay, we are, by the way, two hours 12 into our footage, which is four hours and 55 minutes long. For a, to give an opinion on the blood lines are off, or how much blood should there have been, or the water is too dark. I noticed they only showed two photos of their head size at that point. But what is, there hasn't been enough foundation to elicit that testimony. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, I'll hear your response. Thank you, Your Honor. First of all, Ms. Acevedo was noticed to the defense as an expert in this case. She gave testimony at the grand jury where she talked about all manners of things that are involved in being a death investigator and a coroner. Those included her observations of things that were odd, strange, and different from what she would expect to see based on the thousands of deaths that she has attended over the course of her career. She is very experienced. She has seen thousands of deaths. She was noticed to the defense. And Judge, her testimony here today is not going into the areas of medical opinions. She is noting things that, based on her training and experience, stood out to her as being odd. She ultimately is involved in making a determination, and the things that she is noting are what part of what led her to that determination. Thank you. In our, uh, just because an expert is listed, the jury still needs to hear the proper foundation on what their experience is and the scope of their expertise. And their opinion is limited to that scope of expertise. There has been no foundation for an expert opinion. Whether or not they've been listed as an expert, they still have to go through that process. Thank you. Okay, well, this is also testified to being the chief uh, deputy coroner for Cooney County that she has attended uh, thousands of deaths and that she's attended, which is ballparking between three to 500 suicides, uh, less than 20 homicides. She described her um, She, she didn't necessarily describe her training in great detail, but she explained her, what her training was. Uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 80 has been admitted into evidence, and so it's in evidence, um, which lists her CV or resume. Shows her extensive work history as a chief deputy coroner since 2004. In case she's had hundreds of hours of training in all types of death. Has worked hundreds of death scenes along with multi-person death scenes. On the stand, she indicated it being in thousands. Um, she described her role as a chief deputy coroner in determining causes and manners of death and certified ways. I think it's, she's certainly established um, expertise by knowledge, skill, and experience, as well as training and education uh, to testify in these areas as to cause of death, manner of death. She's testifying as to her, from her experience, what was suspicious about the scene. That, that seems certainly well within her province as a coroner. And as an expert, uh, based on again her training, experience, education, and all that, this is all well within her purview to testify to. Um, certainly, um, there are certainly grounds for cross examination. It doesn't mean her opinion is unassailable, 
but uh, from the court's view, her testimony uh, would be helpful in the jury in understanding an area outside of the normal person's expertise. And again, I, looking at 702, I think she's well within it. She's been disclosed to no surprise here. Um, and I, I agree, I mean, just simply listing her as an expert in discovery doesn't mean she is an expert. But based on her testimony here today, I find that she uh, is in this area of uh, testimony elicited is appropriate. So I'm overruling the objection. And you are know, uh, uh, what we would want the state to do, and we would expect to do the same with our experts, is to lay the proper foundation and tender to the court as an expert in whatever. What the fear of it is, is that they're going to try to bootstrap someone else's work on bruising or anything like that, that she's not an expert in. And so we would ask that the state tender a witness as an expert in a certain category. Um, 
the purse and the phone were on the counter, and I don't, I don't take my purse to the bathroom with me. Some people may. Okay. Okay. That's a narrative. Um, I'll, I'll just ask the state to direct for the question. Sure. So you noted that there were decorative towels in the bathroom, correct? Correct. Um, did you observe a towel that appeared to be for use after a bath? No. Were there any clothes in the bathroom? No. Is there a bathrobe in the bathroom for that appeared to be for use? Not that I observed. So you only saw decorative towels? Correct. You talked about the um, phone and purse. Um, were those positions within arm's reach of the tub? No. Was there anything about the bath mat that you noted? It was saturated with wet. Was there anything? Um, was there anything about Kendi's uh, upper body that you noted, and in beyond the hair? And I'm going to show you 17E again. Specifically, um, the blood on her face is not going in a proper direction. Did that appear odd to you based on your training and experience? Yes. Were you able to observe a firearm in the tub? Yes. Were you able to observe a casing in the tub? Yes. At some point, were you present when law enforcement drained the water from the tub? Yes. Um, in doing that, were steps taken to preserve evidence? Yes. A uh, measurement of the water was done, as well as a sample of the water was taken. After the water was drained, were steps taken to remove Kenny from the tub? Yes. Uh, At, I'm sorry. After she was removed from the tub, um, were steps taken to um, bag her body? Yes. Yeah. And in doing so, were steps taken to preserve any potential evidence that may be present on her body? Yes. Can you describe that process? Her hands were bagged with paper bags. Both were bagged um, and zip tied and sealed. How far up the arm did those bags go? Oh, coming mid arm. At the time that Kendi Howard was being placed into a body bag, did you continue to document as you had previously? Yes. Did you take photographs of um, Kendi once she was in the body bag? Yes. I have permission to approach with 17 L and K. You ready? recognize these photos? Yes. What do you recognize these photos to be? Can you know it in the body bag. Are these your photos? Yes. Do you accurately picture as you saw her that night? Yes. Good to admit, 17 L and K. Any objection? Move to publish. You may. They are admitted. It's kind of creepy to think that the bath mat was wet, right? And then it was, there were towels and another bath mat or something in the dryer is what they said so it's almost like he put her in that chokehold made her pass out and i don't know if she was in the bath already when he did that you know what i mean either way it's almost as if he was there obviously around the bath and getting the bath mat wet and then putting towels in another mat in the washer it's just weird but he what they said earlier was that uh, carotid restraint technique or whatever that he used so that would just make a pass out usually um which is different than it would hide signs of asphyxiation because although they did say on the incident report that she died from asphyxiation so it's not like she just passed out and died from the gunshot wound. they said she died from asphyxiation but with the type of way that he did it he did it so that he wouldn't break you know a hyoid bone and they went the usual signs of for instance strangulation which is Pretty scary, my goodness. If 
Why did you take this photo? It's a it's a normal photo for us to take um, pictures of people's necks. Always. Is there anything about this neck that stood out to you? In this particular picture, um, it shows sparing. What's it called sparing? And what is sparing? The foundation. I'll move on. It sounds like she was going to tell you what it was. I'll withdraw the question for okay. now. Alright. Why did you take this picture? Again, the blood um, is going in the wrong direction. And when you say the blood, which specific area of the blood are you referring to? The blood on the nose. What about the blood on the cheek? Yes. Sorry, I can't see that one. If you need to, ma'am, if you need to step out of here, if it would help your testimony, feel free to step out and you can refer to the screen better. Um, okay. We probably have a point to it. Mark. The blood that is on her cheek has some overlay blood on it, but the blood on her nose is running in an upward position, um, which, again, is going the wrong way for somebody that has a head down in a back cut from a, from a gunshot wound to mouth. Thank you. That is a giant red flag. The blood on her nose was running upwards. Oh, dear. This guy's a dumbass. We like it when criminals are dumb. You may take your seat. We take your seat. Gerard, you previously indicated that you wanted to stop at the minimum. Correct. It, it, I'm about to veer into a different line of questioning, so I don't know if you want to stop now. Sure. That's pretty natural time to stop, so we'll stop for a while. Much hour. Glad to see you all back in the room. Glad you have some space in case among yourselves or with anyone else. Lunchtime teleport. Here we go. Are you ready? <laughs> Going back to the photographs that you took at the scene, when you saved those photographs, did you title them a certain way? I did. What did you call them? Howard Suicide. Did you call these photographs Howard Suicide because that was your opinion? No. Why did you call them Howard Suicide? When we get called out to a scene, sometimes um, it will be labeled as such, as a, as a car accident, as a possible suicide. Um, it, it, it was just a title for pictures. When you were first called out to the scene, were you called out for a possible suicide? Yes. Did the coroner's office ever make a manner of death determination? Yes. When approximately was that issued? Once the autopsy had been done and the report had been completed. Do you recall approximately what month that occurred? I don't. Was it fairly close in time to her death? Within a few months? Yes. And what was the determination at that point in time? It was marked as an undetermined at that time. I'm going to show you what's been marked as 19A. Do you recognize this? Yes. Did you... Um, are the photographs that you took utilized in 19A? Yes. Did you review 19A to determine whether your photographs were accurately depicted in 19A? Yes. Did you um, agree with how the, your photographs were utilized in 19A? Yes. Did they match your review of your photographs? Yes. Do you recognize this document? I do. Is that your signature on it? Yes, it is. And is this a true copy? Yes, it is. Uh, and your Honor, uh, we move to, uh, what is it in general without telling what's in it? It's a death certificate. Okay. Uh, your Honor, move to admit defense exhibit C. Any objection? Sorry, there was a bit of a jump cut there. So obviously the defense is now asking, so cross-examination. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Devin says, this court audio sucks so badly and you should hear the original feed. It's so bad. This is boosted. You know, this is 12 times louder than what it was. <laughs> My goodness. 
Is it C as a bid? So this was signed on June 21st of 2021, correct? Yes. On there, you have a cause of death listed, correct? Yes. The cause Objection. Of What's your objection? Hearsay. Well, the document's been admitted, so it can be used. You listed here a cause of death as cervical spine or transection, correct? Correct. And penetrating gunshot wound head and neck, correct? Correct. Nowhere in this document that you signed on June of 2021 is strangulation mark, correct? No. Now, that document uh, also that we just admitted as a uh, defense exhibit C also puts a time of death on it, correct? Correct. Do you remember what time that was? I do not. Okay. But it was sometime uh, around 23 or 5 of February 2nd? Okay, if that's what it says. Okay. Do you have anything? All right. You got a call at 5 in the morning on the uh, 3rd, correct? Yes. You responded to the scene? Yes. When you get there, you obviously are talking to law enforcement, correct? Yes. And then after you talk to law enforcement, at some point you take photos, correct? Yes. So these photos that you took, uh, this is 17A, you took this photo, correct? Yes. That's, you, you took these between 7.30 and 8 o'clock, right? Okay, yes. Is, is that a yes? It's yes. Okay, so after the body has been in the tub for eight or so hours, you took these photos. Correct. And there's still a large red tint to it, correct? Yes. When you drain the tub, this is 17C, you see the blood draining to, to the drain. Yes. How much blood drained down that drain in those eight hours? Objection calls for speculation. You're drawing the question. Now, you say, stated that. Uh, I like that. <laughs> Her face is like. And we got, she's got the mask on because she's got um, a cold or something. And so we can't even see your whole face, but you could see the snarky brows like, what? So he's trying to imply that blood drained, you know, in a closed drain. It just drained down. So they don't really know how much there was. Okay. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Uh, anyone can be a coroner in Idaho if they meet a couple qualifications, right? Correct. Um, you have to be a resident of Idaho for a year. Yes. You have to be over your age. Yes. Um, there's no educational requirements to become a coroner, right? Correct. Um, you're not a medical pathologist, correct? I am not. Um, you don't have a doctor's degree? Nope. You have an associate's degree? Yes. Now, you filled out a kind of narrative as part of your investigation, correct? Right? Yes. And in there, you specifically state... Objection. Hearsay. This it's not hearsay, it's her statement, Your Honor. It's still hearsay. It's not a quick statement. I'll, I'll rephrase. You um, had observations at the scene, correct? Yes. And it was your opinion that there was an obvious water line... Objection. Hearsay. Let me rephrase. Was there an obvious water line around the body? Yes. Okay. Was there blood spatter on the breast? Yes. Was the blood spatter on the top of the right hand? I would need to look at a photo. Was there blood spatter on the top of the left hand? Yes. There was no obvious trauma to the body, correct? And not that I could see under the water. When you filled out your narrative for your report, did you fill that out after the autopsy? No. Okay. Over the 
Your Honor. Your Honor. I have been a deputy coroner since 2004. I was placed as the chief deputy in 2015. Thank you for that clarification. And if you talk a little bit about how you have to do continuing education as well. Yes. So I think the jury just left the room again. Got a sidebar. <laughs> Not a silent one. One where they're going to discuss this now. Outside of the presence of the jury. This is declared that this is prior statement is not hearsay and should be admitted because it has been attacked by Mr. Johnson in his line of questioning with regards to that determination. And so I do believe that it's time she should be able to talk about her prior statements about the document that counsel entered into evidence. Maybe I misunderstood. <clears throat> the question was, you know, at that time, was there discussion about the current state of the investigation? Yes, based on the present state of the investigation, it's a decision made to mark this as determined. The judge was cause for hearsay. So I was just going simply on the, if, if she's essentially answering what the consensus of the group was, then that is hearsay. But if you're just, if you're saying something different, um, I can look at that differently. I mean, I think really, really the question is basically whether or not she was aware of the investigation at the time the determination was made. I can rephrase it to that. Yeah, sure. that you, you can ask that. I just thought, as it was phrased, I thought you were, it was essentially asking what the consensus, you know, the conversation on the group was, yeah, we should mark this on the term. That would be hearsay, but certainly if you want to ask about her knowledge of the ongoing investigation, why she ultimately decided to mark it that's fair. And, and I'll, I'll let you guys talk. Okay. I'm assuming, Mr. Jones, I kind of mistaken, but I thought your objection was accurate. Yes, yeah, sure. And, and uh, the, her, I want to be clear that we never, under cross, asked her about anything after the state. So anything after the state would be outside of the scope of cross. The state had no objective to, to the seat. We didn't ask for anything about what occurred or the investigation after that date. And so any questions related to that would be outside the scope of the clause. I'm just anticipating some questions here. All right. We'll bring in the jury. Was the information contained in that document the only available information that you had at that point in time? Yes. 
Thank you, man. You missed that job. My eye rolls off for the ever-changing audio from the court feed. <laughs> now it's for real out again. Okay, so that was witness number pop quiz. <laughs> What witness was that? That was witness number 14, Lynn Acevedo, Chief Deputy Coroner. Putting out some red flags about that crime scene, right? Especially with blood going upwards. Oh my goodness. So now we're going to have witness number 15. And there should be this witness and two more for the day. That other two will be the victim's parents. Shame. My goodness. Okay, so let's have a listen over here. We're two hours 42 in um, out of our footage, which is four hours and 55. Okay, well. <coughs> okay. Could you please state your full name and spell your last name for the record? Yes, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Jennifer Nara. Nara spelled N as in Nancy, A R A. How are you currently employed? I am currently a forensic pathology consultant for a forensic engineering company called BSI Engineering Systems Incorporated. Are you a medical doctor? Yes, I am. Can you describe your educational background? Sure. Um, I go back to the 1990s. I attended the University of Washington in Seattle. I then went down to Pomona, California. I went to medical school at Western University of Health Sciences. And then I went all the way out to Honolulu to the University of Hawaii to do my four-year pathology residency program. And then in order to become a forensic pathologist, we are required to do an additional one-year forensic pathology fellowship. So then I traveled all the way across the U.S. to Miami, Florida to do my one-year forensic pathology fellowship. And before we go any farther, what is a forensic pathologist? Sure. A forensic pathologist is a subspecialty of pathology. So when you think of a pathologist, you think of the nerdy doctors that work in the lab. Uh, when you're a doctor, let's say, sees a funny-looking mole and takes a biopsy and they send it off to the laboratory, the general pathologist will look at it under the microscope and give your doctor a diagnosis so your doctor can decide what to do with that mole. A forensic pathologist, in that extra year of training, we study autopsy pathology. And we do autopsies, we work with forensic investigators, go to crime scenes, and we do autopsies in order to determine the cause and manner of death. We also speak with uh, family members, answer questions that they have regarding their loved ones, and we testify in court. I'm just going to get up a bit, so I'm going to be off camera for a second here. I just want to like stretch my legs, because sitting here for six hours is not that healthy. <laughs> I'm always like, I will, I'll get up every now and then, but then I just don't, so I'm just going to... Just stand up for a second while we watch this. I'm still here with you. Okay, I'm not going anywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm watching you. <laughs> okay, so let's continue to listen. This What an excellent witness, right? She's so nice to listen to Dr. Jennifer Nara. It's like, okay. Coming back to your education, do you hold any special certifications or um, members to any boards? Yes, I am board certified by the American Board of Pathology. I am board certified in anatomic pathology as well as in forensic pathology. And are those current? Yes, they are current. Do you ever write, publish, or review literature in your field? Um, I have in the past. Um, one of the papers that I did with another fellow forensic pathologist studied contact gunshot wounds involving center fire rifle wounds um, versus shotgun slug wounds. And do you regularly review? literature in your field in order to maintain competency on new developments? Yes, we do. Have you ever testified as an expert witness before? Yes, I have. You told us who your present employer was. Can you talk about your previous employers? Sure. Before I became a consultant for ESI, I worked as a medical examiner for the Spokane County Medical Examiner's Office. I was there for two years. And prior to that, um, I was in Florida where I worked as a medical examiner out there. In either your time in Spokane or your time in Florida, did you have opportunities to perform autopsies? Yes. Do you still currently perform autopsies? I currently do. I still do autopsies a few days a month just to stay current for Clark County in Vancouver, Washington. 
Over the course of your career, approximately how many autopsies have you done? Um, to date, including the autopsies that I'm still doing, it's probably close to 4,300 autopsies. And within your various employers, have you also worked in other capacities? Okay. In, with your other employers, have you worked in any other capacities besides strictly doing autopsies? Um, yes, so uh, with my current employer, I am doing autopsies three days a month. Um, I am working on various different consultation cases, both criminal cases as well as civil cases. What are the typical duties of a county medical exam? A county medical examiner works for the local government, whether it's for the city or the county, or sometimes in some states it's for the state. And depending on the law in that jurisdiction, um, some mostly non-natural deaths will come into the medical examiner's office for examination. So the county medical examiner is responsible for reviewing, determining whether an autopsy needs to be done in order to determine the cause of death. Is there a difference between a medical examiner and a forensic pathologist? Yes, so a medical examiner is a forensic pathologist, uh, but they're employed by the local government. Um, while a forensic pathologist is just a general term, which includes a medical examiner. So a medical examiner is a forensic pathologist, but not all forensic pathologists like myself are medical examiners. Throughout the education, residency, fellowships, and on the job experience you described, um, have you received specific training in how to do an autopsy? Yes, we learned during our four year pathology residency program how to do a general autopsy, um, autopsies that are done in the hospital setting, so they're pretty much all just natural deaths. And then it's during our forensic fellowship, the one year of additional training, where we are immersed in attending crime scenes and doing all types of different autopsies on both natural deaths as well as non-natural deaths. As part of that training, are you um, either educated or received on-the-job training to opine as to cause and manner of death? Yes, so the purpose of doing an autopsy, um, we do the autopsy after considering the different circumstances and we get that information from our forensic investigators. So when we take all that information together, in addition to what we find at autopsies, that's what we will use in order to determine the cause of death. And is that different from the manner of death? Yes, so cause of death is why is an individual dead? Um, did they have a blocked coronary artery? Did they have a hemorrhagic stroke? Did they have head trauma in a car accident? It's why are they dead? Well, manner of death is how. So there's five different manner of deaths we have homicide, suicide, natural, accident, and undetermined. You testified that you've personally done over 4,000 autopsies. Have you ever reviewed other people's autopsies? Yes, I have. And is it common for individuals in your field to review autopsies performed by other forensic pathologists? It actually is quite common, um, especially not just Florida, but in other states where doctors are no longer at the office, if they've moved away, they've retired, or they're deceased, then the doctors are still at the office. We go on a rotation where we will assign a previous pathologist case to review it, come up with our own independent opinion, and then we will go ahead and testify in court on their behalf. Is it common for individuals in your field to review the documentation or findings of other forensic pathologists in order to form your own independent opinion? Yes, that is something that we um, definitely do. We do review any information that the original pathologist has reviewed. Question to approach? Yeah. Dr. Nara, can you give me what's in Mark the state's 81? Do you recognize this? Yes, I do. What do you recognize this to be? This is my current CV or resume. And would you mind flipping through that just to confirm that that is um, your most up-to-date and accurate resume?
Yes. We have to admit states 81. No objection. 81 is admitted. Don't ask me why my camera is making me so red. <laughs> Did my stiffies. <laughs> anyway, I'm I'm back. Um, I took you with me to the kitchen. Okay. Um, in a medical examiner system, it's up to the doctor who does the autopsy to determine whether a complete autopsy needs to be done or whether they can do an external examination. In other jurisdictions, especially a coroner, um, the jurisdiction, it's the coroner who decides that an autopsy needs to be done. Where, generally, are autopsies conducted? Autopsies are conducted in a medical examiner's office. And generally, who is present during autopsy? The people that are present during an autopsy are those agencies that are directly involved in the investigation, whether it's law enforcement, um, a prosecutor, a defense attorney, or if it's a pediatric case, child protective services. Is it common or standard practice even for documentation to be done throughout the autopsy? Yes. What types of documentation are done? In addition to the pathologist documenting on a diagram, um, different findings that they see both on the outside of the body as well as on the inside of the body, the pathologist will also be assisted by an autopsy technician to take photographs of the body external as well as internal throughout the examination. Is what is done in the autopsy, does that change depending on the observations of the forensic pathologist? Yes, so not every autopsy is done exactly the same. If a case has a lot of injuries or if it's a more suspicious case in some for some reason, then the doctor may decide I may take some more samples for toxicology testing. I may do additional photographic documentation. Um, I may do a death section in a certain part of the body that normally we normally may not have to do, but we want to look at the injuries a little bit better that way. And is that something that the forensic pathologist decides as he or she is going through the autopsy? Sometimes it's done during the autopsy, we come across something unusual. Sometimes we know if we have a heads up um, that a case is not your typical case or there's something suspicious about it, then we may go ahead and um, be proactive about doing something extra during the autopsy. Are there times where forensic pathologists may receive information about the disease prior to conducting the autopsy? Yes, ideally we would like to have as much information ahead of time. Sometimes that's just not feasible. We just might have like a limited investigation report before we start the autopsy. We may not have access to medical records before starting an autopsy. But I would say for the most part, we at least have preliminary information. <clears throat> and is what is provided to the medical examiner ahead of time, could that change what the forensic pathologist does in the autopsy. So any information that we have prior to doing an autopsy, that's, we use that as a guideline for what we're going to do and if anything extra, like taking extra samples for testing, needs to be done. After the autopsy, is it typical for the pathologist to generate a report? Yes. And what's the purpose of that? So we take all our notes and then after reviewing all the photographs, we generate a report. It's a formal report that goes out, um, and that report is a final documentation of what we found and determined during the autopsy. It documents the cause of death, and that report can also be used, for example, if family members want to know what happened, or if uh, law enforcement needs that information, and of course, that information could be used when we testify in court. In reviewing autopsies performed by others, do you solely rely on the report from the medical examiner informing your independent opinion? No. What other things would you rely upon? 
So when we're asked to review a medical examiner case, of course we're going to look at the original report that the original pathologist did. But we're also going to look at any and all photographs, both if they're seen photographs, if there's autopsy photographs, if there's any investigation reports, if there's any new information that has come up, um, we want to look at all of that. So if you you can't really say what a um, forensic pathologist would look like, right? But uh, I just feel like if I saw this lady like in, in a cafe or like a restaurant, I wouldn't know that that's her job, right? She's so elegant, so nice, right? So thank you all so that I could get up a little bit that I wasn't on camera for a second there. This is a tiny cup. Why? Because it's an espresso. That's right. <laughs> Maybe it's too big of a cup for an espresso. Yes, indeed. So thank you all for being here. If you're only joining now, I hope you'll check out the description box because there's a whole write-up there for you about what this case is about. We're on day three now. Um, we are one day behind the live coverage because we started a day late as well. So on day one and two, you could just check out the timestamps. And then today I also, I always do timestamps for you right afterwards to show you exactly which witness was on when and, uh, you know, if it was direct examination or cross-examination and all that. So we are now on witness number 15. And out of the case, there should be 55 to 60 witnesses for the state. I'm not too sure how many the defense plan to have um who knows sometimes they just <laughs> as we've seen in other trials just like oh, okay rest rest my case we shall see uh, how many they'll have but the trial is expected to last about three weeks so we'll be together this whole week okay we're almost there on a friday now and then uh, we'll also be cover catching up on the weekend and then two more weeks after that yes indeed so let's have a listen i'm so glad that there's other forensic pathologists, coroners, medical examiners that attended to this case that, that never, you know, relies just on one opinion. Because if they relied only on one opinion, well, then the guy, the first guy did quite a lazy job and said, undetermined death. Unfortunately, then, you know, it delayed, I think, the arrest a little bit. The investigation went on, there were second opinions and things, and they're like, this is so not someone taking their own life. This is a Homicide. So here we are at a trial where a former Idaho state police trooper is on trial for the murder of his wife and also facing uh, domestic battery charges from an incident from July of 2020, which was about seven months before the murder took place, the alleged murder. Okay. So we're about, we're almost three hours in now out of four hours and 55 of the trial footage. Why is it shorter here? Is because I defluff it. I cut out all the lunch breaks, coffee breaks, and long pauses, and as much paper flapping as possible. If you were to do an independent review of an autopsy, would you consider information that was perhaps not available to the original pathologist? Yes, that would be any information that the pathologist had at the time and anything new since that time. Have you ever reviewed an autopsy that was done by someone else to form your own independent opinion? Yes, I have. And have you ever testified to your independent opinion based on an autopsy done by someone else? Yes. Dr. Nara, what does intraoral mean? Intraoral means there's an injury that is inside the mouth. <clears throat> Is a gunshot a common cause of an intraoral wound? Uh, gunshot wound, yes, it's a type of intraoral injury. My goodness, some of this content might be distressing for some, so keep that in mind as well. They are discussing throughout this case domestic violence, taking one's own life. That's a word YouTube doesn't like me to say. So, yes, just know that. If it's too much for you, we'll just know we'll save you a seat. You can come back anytime. And thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you all watching this trial with me. Uh, Laterella said, this community is so kind and respectful. I came in to keep up on this trial for my loved ones grieving the victim. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry to hear that. And you said, but the wholesomeness of this group makes me want to watch other videos. Thank you so much and welcome. I hope that you will feel safe here and know that here we respect victims and their families and of course their friends. So thank you so much for watching here with us. And silly question, but that would be something that was caused by a gun? Correct. Have you ever personally performed autopsies on individuals that have sustained an intraoral gunshot wound? Yes, I have. Approximately how many? Um, let's see, in Florida we have a lot of gunshot wound injuries. I want to say about mostly, close to a thousand gunshot cases in general. 
and your oil gotcha wounds, maybe anywhere between 150 to 200 cases. Are there physical injuries that are typically, or that you might expect to see from an intraoral gunshot wound? Depending on the caliber of the gun that's used, we would see sometimes see bruising on the mouth, sometimes if their mouth is closed firmly around the muscle, we might see what we call stretch tears on the side of the mouth. We can also see uh, broken teeth, broken um, gums inside the mouth. What about a cavity? Do you ever see a, a cavity inside the mouth that's caused by the gunshot wound? A cavity mean like a defect? Sure. Yes, we would see a defect, whether it's in the roof of the mouth, depending on where the bullet went, or in the back of the throat. Is the Spokane County Sheriff's Office aware of any We went on a, we had a rotation of when we were assigned to do autopsies that day, and if there was a case that came in from an outside county, such as Kootenai County, then um, we would be up for performing autopsies for that county. So did Spokane County employ multiple doctors? Yes. Do you recall how many worked there at the time that you were there? When I started there, I was the third doctor, so there were two other pathologists working there. Did that change before you left? Yes, it did. How did that change? The two doctors that were there, they both retired. And did they subsequently hire new doctors to fill those positions? Yes. When you worked at the Spokane County Medical Examiner's Office, did you work with the doctor by the name of John Howard? Yes, I did. How long did you work with John Howard? I think my overlap with Dr. John Howard for about a year. Was he one of the two doctors that was there when you started? Yes. And so would he be one of the doctors that was there when you left? Or excuse me, was he one of the two doctors that left while you were still there? That's right. During the year that you worked with Dr. John Howard, did you have observation, the ability to observe his work? I did. How would you describe John Howard's work when you first began working with him? Dr. John Howard, he had a <clears throat> yeah, overall quiet demeanor. Um, he came in every day and he reviewed his cases and he did his autopsies. Um, if I, since I was new to the office, if I had any questions regarding policies or protocol, he, uh, I would reach out to him and he was always willing to answer my questions. Did you have opportunities to observe his autopsies? I have observed a few of his autopsies. Do you have opportunities to interact with John Howard um, towards the end of his career before he retired? Yes, I did. He's the naughty doctor that just was, what did they call it again? Short timers syndrome. That's what they called it. And uh, that means he was about to retire. Didn't care as much anymore. Just, uh, he was investigated later for something like 14 rulings that he made that were not quite correct or just, he should have done a better job. So interesting to hear about him. His name is Dr. John Howard, not related to the defendant, Daniel Howard, or the victim, Kendi Howard. Just the same surname, ironically. Was there a change in his demeanor from the times that you met him in the beginning when you worked with him at the end? Change in all this? Hold on. I don't know if there was so much a big change. Um... I knew even from the beginning, and it was something Dr. John Howard did in high. He had been working, I don't know, close to 30 years, and he was pretty much ready to retire, and he loved to talk about how he was ready to retire. Are you aware that there was an autopsy performed on an individual by the name of Kenny Howard in February of 2021? Yes. Are you aware of approximately when John Howard left the Spokane County Medical Examiner's office? Judge Rollins. Response? 
not without getting a speaking objection, Judge. I'm happy to. We approach. Sure. Call approximately when John Howard retired. I believe it was in the summer of 2021, 2022. Sorry, I'm trying to remember what's, um, I started in 2020 in Spokane. So it was a year later, 2021, it was the summer. Getting back to the autopsy of Kenny Howard, you are aware that Kenny Howard was sent to Spokane County Medical Examiner's Office for an autopsy, correct? Yes. You are not the person who performed that autopsy, correct? Correct. Who performed that autopsy? Dr. John Howard. Did you have an opportunity to review that report? Yes, I have. Where did that autopsy take place? That took place at the Spokane County Medical Examiner's Office. Do you recall the specific date that it took place? Dr. John Howard performed the autopsy on February 3rd, 2021. That was the day after she was deceased. In your review of um, Meliasis, did you only review the autopsy or did you also review any documentation that was associated with the report of the autopsy? I reviewed the autopsy report as well as any photos and any other documentation relating to the case. How was Kendi Howard's body received by the Spokane County Medical Examiner's Office? So all patients that arrive at the medical examiner's office, they come in through the receiving area where their um, toe tag and the body tag, body bag tag is double checked to make sure it's the right individual. The body is weighed, that's recorded, and then they're placed in the cooler until they are uh, ready for autopsy. Is that what happened with Kenny Howard? Yes. And so was her identity confirmed for beginning the autopsy? Yes, it was. During the autopsy, were photographs taken? Yes, photographs were taken. And would it have been standard procedure at Spokane County Medical Examiner's Office to take photographs during autopsy? Yes. Are those photographs taken at different points in the procedure? Yes, they're taken from the beginning throughout the autopsy. And again, you have the opportunity to review those photographs? Yes. And it's common for experts in your field to review photographs taken during autopsy in order to form your independent opinion? That's correct. And in your review of the autopsy report and the subsequent photographs, did it appear that those match? Yes. Permission to approach the witness with 26A through J? May. Dr. Nauer, I'm showing you what is states 26A through J. I'm just going to flip through these. Let me know if you, so just for the record, it's going to be 26B, 26B Zoom, 26C, 26C Zoom, 26D, 26D Crop, 26E, 26F, 26F Zoom, 26G, 26G Zoom, 26H, 26H Zoom, 26I, 26I Zoom. Do you recognize those pictures? Yes, I do. And what do you recognize those to be? They were autopsy photographs taken of Ms. Kenny Howard. Do those, um, there were several in there that were notated as zooms or crops. Did those appear to be reflective of the original photographs, just zoomed or cropped? That's correct. Move to admit 26A through J. And Judge, I can lay the specific zooms and crops in the record as well if you would like. Um, any objection? There you go. That's not necessary. They're admitted, well, including the zooms and crops. Mission at this time to publish. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
luckily, they don't show us the pictures. So the camera person, because we don't know if it's a guy. Is it a lady? Is it a guy? We don't know. The camera person was very good at not showing these. Okay, they just describe it. Dr. Nara, when bodies arrive at autopsy, are they typically still in the body bag? Yes, they are. And when they are removed from the body bag, what do you expect to see? Whatever, if they were found outside, they would have whatever debris may still be stuck on the body. Um, individuals that come from the resident or the hospital, sometimes they're leaking fluid or bloody fluid. It's very common. In your review of the photos, was there a photo of Kendi Howard's body before she was... Let me, let me back up. Are bodies typically cleaned before the autopsy procedure begins? Yes, they are cleaned before the autopsy. Was there a photograph that was taken of the body before it was cleaned? Yes. Did you make any opinion about the state of the body before it was cleaned? No, we always take photos as is. The body is first um, looked at inside the body bag, and then once the body is cleaned, we take additional photos. Before the body of Kenny Howard was cleaned, was there anything unusual noted about the body? Aside from her injury, no. Right. no. So the photographs that I'm going to show you, those would be after her body has been cleaned? Yes. Let's start with 26B. What do you recognize these to be? This photo is showing her legs from the knee area down to her feet. Dr. Mara, I, I know you're sitting kind of side, but if you need to enter what we call the well and stand here to see the photos better, you're more than welcome to, if that helps you. Just right in front. Sure. Part of Kenny's body is depicted in this picture. So here we're looking at her right, pretty much her entire right arm. Is there anything in this picture that you noted? Can I get closer to this one? Okay. Would you like a pointer? That will work. So if we look at her right upper arm here, there's like one, two, three areas of blue, blue purple bruising. And Dr. Nara, I'm sorry, I'm going to take you back to that one we were just looking at, this 26B. Did you note any injuries in that photograph? You can see here, this is the right knee. There's some bruises here on the right knee area and the front of the right lower leg and some faint bruises here on the inside of the left thigh. 26 E. Looks like to the outside of the wrist. I can't tell which left or right, but there's bruising here and here. Looking at her legs again here. There's some bruises we saw earlier here on the right knee, and then there's stuff here on the left thigh and the left knee area. This is the zoom of 26F that we just looked at. Here we're looking at the top of the right knee. There's bruising here that we can see. And Something here too. Looks like a bruise on the right calf. Twenty-six G. Going back to the right knee, <clears throat> right here we saw this bruise here, bruising here below the knee. There's some bruising here on the front of the right lower leg. Twenty-six I. This is a zoomed out photo, pretty much showing the same thing. Bruises here on the right knee and right lower leg, as well as here on the left leg and thigh. 26i zoom. So this would be a zoomed in of what we just looked at. So this is a zoomed in of the left inner thigh, and there's some bruising here. Okay, Dr. Mara, we looked at some of these injuries um, in close up. 
what would your opinion be of the cause of some of these injuries? The injuries we saw were called contusions or bruises on her arms and legs, and that's from, could be from a variety of different reasons, whether something struck the leg or she bumped her leg against something. In your independent opinion, are these injuries um, consistent with occurring before death? The bruises that we saw, they all had a pretty much like a blue, purple um, hue to them. They looked pretty recent. They could have occurred that day, could have been the day before. Just remember, there was domestic violence in the relationship, so it's more than likely from that. But we just don't know. It's just that that was already a red flag, you know, for the forensic pathologist, medical examiner's coroner that actually did their job on this case, <laughs> you know, instead of having the short timer syndrome. And they were like, hmm, a lot of bruising, you know, on her body before her death. Can you take a break this time? Okay. Thank you. Taking at the time about autopsy and the other two are... Do you like how quick that break was? <laughs> it was mere seconds <laughs> edited for you. The x-rays. And just for the record, L and K are the x-rays? L and K, yes. Yeah. Y, and as I'm flipping through, just let me know if you don't recognize these. Okay. 20X, 20W, 20B, 20U, 20T, 20S, 20R, 20Q, 20P, 20O, 20N, 20J, 20I, 20H, 20G, 20F, 20E, 20D, 20C, 20B, and 20A. Would you recognize all those photos? Yes, I do. And are those the photos from Kendi Howard's autopsy? Yes. And are those the ones that were taken contemporaneously? Yes. Likewise, I'm going to show you these zooms. Let me know if these don't correspond with an original photo. 20B zoom. 20C zoom. 20F zoom, 20I zoom, 20J zoom, 20K zoom, 20L zoom, 20M zoom, 20N zoom, 20S zoom, 20J crop, 20W zoom, and 20W zoom too. Okay. Do those all correspond with an original photo? Yes. They appear to be altered other than zoomed or cropped? No. Alright, it's time to move to admit all of those photos. No objection. Those are admitted. And first, as we move forward, if you need to step into the well, I don't know if you still have that pointer. Dr. I think that would be a good idea. We can do that pointer again.
record, 20B. This is looking at the outside of her left hand. This is her pinky finger. There's bruising here and bruising here. We saw a similar photo earlier looking at the right upper arm area. We saw these three bruises here. Q. Looking at the inside, I believe this is the inside of the right elbow. We can see a close up of this bruise here. Is that likewise depicted in 20 O? Or is that a different bruise? I think it's the same one. This is just more zoomed out so we get a perspective of where it is on her arm. Is there something else observable in this photograph? Look at the inside of her right forearm up here. You see some discoloration. It kind of looks like orange peachy discoloration here on the inside of the right forearm. Is that what is also depicted in 20 R? Yeah, so this is a close up, a zoomed in photo showing this burn here on the inside of her right forearm. Are you familiar with what uh, skin slippage is? Yes. What is skin slippage? Skin slip is when the top layer of the skin just kind of comes off. We can see that right here. Uh, sometimes if you scrape your, your top layer of your skin really superficially and you kind of brush it off, that would be skin sloughing or skin slip. In pathology, we also use the words skin slip when the body's decomposing and it's breaking down, the skin starts breaking down. We also see it in bodies that are immersed in water for an extended period of time and then the skin would start slipping off. Are the pink areas that we see in this picture skin slippage in your opinion? <coughs> These darker pink discolored areas, um, no. So when you said that you observed skin slippage in this photograph, you are not referring to the pink areas. This dark pink discolored areas, I am not. In your opinion, are those pink colored areas an injury? Yes. What kind of injury? I mentioned a little earlier, they look like they're consistent with some type of burn. 20P. Here we're looking at, it's like, again, the inside of the right forearm, we saw. This pink discoloration up here, we see additional bruising on the outside of the right forearm. Which if you guys remember from opening statements, uh, the prosecutor pointed out if she had a burn on her arm, she wouldn't be getting into a hot bath either. That doesn't make sense either. We do not know what the burn was from or what all these, what sounds like defensive wounds and bruises are from. It could have been over days. Remember, he was already standing over her four days before on January 29th. She woke up and he was standing, the defendant was standing over her, her husband, right? Daniel Howard. Wearing all black with black gloves and she thought, oh man, he's going to kill me. And then we saw her pack a bag and leave. We saw the body cam of that yesterday. So if you missed that, check out yesterday's uh, stream that was all timestamped for you. So you could, you know, see that, which was, as I say, four days before the alleged murder took place. N. Here we're looking at, on the outside of her right breast, there's a bruise right here. Back to them. Absolutely. Yeah. It's not 
for the record, going back to 20 E. And then here again, it just looks a little more full. And I think there was another one where we could look at those slides. I'll show you 20 B. Yeah, so the left side of her jaw appears to be more full than the right side of the jaw. And while we're looking at this picture, are there observable injuries in this picture? Yes, so looking at the front of her face, we saw this bruise on the left side of her nose, and then looking at her mouth, which is slightly open, there's bruising here and bruising here on both sides of the lower lip, and also a bruise on the tip of the tongue. Twenty C. Another photo showing the same bruises, left side of the nose, as well as bruising on the left side of her lower lip and the tip of her tongue. 20F. It's a close up of that bruise we saw on her left jaw. See it here on the left side of her chin, jaw, and upper neck area. 20H. It's a close up showing bruising, and there's also some cuts here on the left lower lip. So to look at the injury better, we pull the lower lip down. You can see the bruising here, and there's cuts here on the inside of the lower lip. Thank you, Dr. Nari, you can take your seat. I'm going to take you back to the injury that you described as a burn. Recall that image? Yes, I do. Um, if you are performing an autopsy personally and you observe a burn to the body, um, is there anything that you would do to investigate that burn further? Um, depending on the extent of the burn, I mean, someone's charred does one thing, uh, but if I see just like a single area where it looks to be a burn, I'll take additional photographs, and the other thing we also do at autopsies, we can make a little incision into that area and then take a section to look under the microscope. Was that done in this case? I believe that was not done in this case. Can you talk about the injury to the head? Um, was a wound documented that was not readily able to be seen in those pictures? And when documented in the head um, that I knew from reviewing the autopsy? Yes. Yes, so we saw there was a bruising to the tip of the tongue. Um, so inside the mouth, there is an intraoral gunshot wound. Can you describe um, how that intraoral gunshot wound went through the mouth? Sure, so the bullet traveled through the tongue. It traveled into the pharynx, which is the tube in the back of your throat, so you breathe and digest. It goes through C2, which is your second cervical spine in your neck, went through the spinal cord in your neck, and then it, the bullet came to rest in the soft tissues in the back of the neck. Now, based on the location of that wound, um, it was not able to be easily photographed, is that correct? Correct. Um, there, your, sorry. Okay. With intraoral gunshot wounds, sometimes people have a lot of rigor mortis where they become really stiff, and we don't want to break the jaw unnecessarily or break their teeth, God forbid. So um, we open the mouth as much as we can at autopsy and try to take a look. Sometimes we'll take a flashlight to see if we can see the gunshot wound defect inside the mouth. Sometimes we can't see it, um, sometimes we can see it depending on the location. This is hectic. Um, Barbara Ann said the plan was revealed by the man in the night with the black clothes and hood over his face. There was premeditation. And I wonder what happened to those gloves, you know, because he was wearing gloves that night on January 29th, four days before, which would help with a gunshot residue because, you know, he was a cop, so he knows things. So I wonder what he did that night, you know, the night of the alleged murder. In this particular case, was there anything about that, the injuries to the mouth, um, that 
was not present that you might expect to see in an intraoral gunshot. So in this case, um, aside from the injuries that we already saw, um, we, she's got a large injury to the tongue. She didn't have any injury to the teeth. We saw the photo where the lower lip was pulled down. You can see the teeth were intact. The gums were all intact. Is that unusual in an intraoral gunshot wound? Unusual, um, no. In this particular case, was a trajectory rod utilized? Yes, a trajectory rod was utilized. Can you describe what a trajectory rod is? Sure. So at time of autopsy, sometimes they're metal rods, sometimes they're plastic rods. We use them to show that the direction the bullet travels. It um, gives a nice overall view. It's a general path, but it allows us to photograph that document, uh, do a photographic documentation to show that it go in a downward direction, that it go left to right. Uh, it's something. It's another tool that we use at autopsy. And was that utilized in this case in order to obtain a trajectory of the bullet? Yes, it was. And was that photographed? Yes. We published the 20J. So you can see the metal rod going in through between your teeth. This one is just showing the general direction that it's going in a front to back direction. You also mentioned when I was initially showing you photographs that there were some x-rays that were done. Do you recall that? Yes. What is the point of taking x-rays during autopsy? So all individuals that come to the medical examiner's office receive an x-ray. And especially if they have um, suspected fractures or a retained foreign body, then we definitely will take expert x-rays to take a look at that. And do the x-rays also help in determining trajectory? They can, yes. I'm going to show you 20L zoom. What do you see in this picture? I'll just step out real quick. So we're looking at the front of the skull here. And these are just, I think these are on the body bag. It's like anything that's like metallic will show up as being uh, radio opaque or this like whitish color in x-ray. But here's the projectile, the bullet. There's some small fragments here as it went through the second cervical spine. The majority of it is here in the soft tissue behind the spine. Um, so this is front and this is the back. Based on your review of the documentation, um, was a trajectory, a continuous trajectory of that bullet? So the tongue's not really going to show up on x-ray because it's not bone, um, but we see the upper jaw here, lower jaw here, so you know the tongue sits right in there. So as it travels through the tongue, through the second cervical vertebrae, it's going in a slightly downward direction. Have you... you can sit back down ever reviewed any literature um, or had any experience with intraoral gunshot trajectory? Uh, yes. Um, Barbara, yes, you actually reminded me of something. You said he forgot gloves when helping her take a bubble bath. That's why he was rubbing his hands in his pockets to remove the gunpowder from his hands. And remember that Detective Lalaton, was his name right? He said that he wanted to see Daniel Howard's reaction. So he said to him, huh, you know, they talked about gunshot residue and he said, did you use your gun that day or anything? And he said, yeah, yeah. He actually used his own handgun that day. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so good point, Barbara. Good point. Do you clarify? Have you ever reviewed medical literature on trajectory in intraoral gunshot wounds? Yes, I have. Have you also had personal experience in autopsies involving intraoral gunshot wounds and terminal trajectory? Yes. What does the, um, are there any, uh, let me phrase it this way, are downward trajectories associated with a particular manner of death? It's not, it doesn't have a direct association, but in the literature and also from experience, we see a downward trajectory more often in non-suicides. And when you say non-suicides, do you mean homicides? Homicides, yes. What about an upward trajectory? So in general, suicide, intraoral gunshot wounds, the majority of them are in an upward direction. Some of them go in um, a horizontal direction or parallel to the horizontal plane. And in the literature, they did document maybe 
like a one or a couple cases where it does go in a downward, but the vast majority of suicide cases go in an upward direction. In your personal experience, have you ever performed an autopsy involving a downward trajectory where the manner of death is determined to be suicide? In a suicide, I personally have not observed a downward direction. Did you ever personally have the opportunity to observe parts of Kennedy Howard's body? Yes. How did that come to occur? So I think that was really bad with dates. It's when I was first asked to review Dr. John Howard's uh, report, um, I had asked, because um, there was a question of whether this was a suicide versus homicide, and I know the bullet went through the tongue. I just I was actually half joking when I asked um, that he happened to save the tongue, because I've, I've never heard of anyone saving the tongue on an alleged suicide case, and the answer was yes. So I was still employed at the Spokane Medical Examiner at that time, so we pulled out the specimen jar. So on everybody we autopsy will take biopsy sections of organs in case we need to go back and take um, additional section to look under the microscope, and so they're saved in a specimen stock jar in formalin as a preservative. So in that jar was the tongue, and I had the opportunity to look at it at the time. Dr. Nara, how unusual was it that John Howard saved the tongue? I thought it was extremely unusual. And, and just to clarify, are we talking about a sectional biopsy of the tongue, or are we talking about the entire tongue? Dr. John Howard saved the entire tongue. Did he save any other part of her body? Just the usual um, biopsy sections of other organs, but no other organ in its entirety, except for the tongue. In your over 4,000 autopsies that you've performed, have you ever saved the tongue? The only time I saved the tongue was in someone who had uh, really bad cancer that was blocking their airway and involved the tongue, and I basically took out the tongue and the whole upper airway just so we could see how bad the cancer was. And nothing like this before? No, nothing like this. So, timeline-wise, you were asked to review this case, correct? Yes. And you said that was when exactly? That would have been, say, 2021 20, was when I first, 2021, 2022, sorry, was when I first took a look. And it was at that time that you retrieved the tongue? Yes. And when you retrieved it, it had been preserved, you stated? Yes, it was preserved in formula. What did you do with it when you retrieved it? So anytime you save tissue in formula, it's a great preservative, but if it's if you have an organ that's soft, such as the tongue or the stomach, it's going to curl up um, even after a day in the preservative. So the tongue, also secondary to the injury, had um, become like misshapen. So I had to take several pins to pretty much put it back together uh, so we could see the tongue in its original form as best as possible. Were you able to, um, to pin it back in such a way that you were able to study it and observe it? Yes. Um, did you, at that time, document what you were doing? Yes. Did you do that in photographs? Yes, we took several photographs. Can <clears throat> you show the witness? You may. Dr. Nara, I'm going to show you what's been marked as 21A through H. Do you recognize these photos? Yes, I do. What do you recognize these to be? This is the tongue that I examined. These are your photographs? These are the photographs uh, that the autopsy technician took at my direction. And these accurately depict the tongue as you saw it on that day? Yes. What does 21H depict? 21H is a cassette that we submit to the laboratory. I went ahead and took a biopsy section at the top of the tongue just so I could look at it under the microscope. All right, time I move to admit that series of photographs. The objection, Dr. They are admitted. <coughs> Dr. Naro, what, um, what observations were you able to make about the tongue at that point in time? 
that there was, um, the tongue has sustained significant injury. Can you describe that injury? It basically looked like um, a torpedo had gone through the tongue. It was like from the front to the back. It was completely torn up. So did, did, did examining the tongue at that level allow you to look at a wound path? Yes. Were you able to see where on the tongue the bullet entered? Yes. And was that top, bottom, middle tip of the tongue? It looked like it was towards the front of the tongue on the top. And then did the bullet actually travel through the tongue itself? Yes. Were you able to make any observations about um, contact between the shot and the tongue? Yes, given that there was presence of soot, which is the burnt gunpowder deposited on whatever surface it touches, there was definitely some soot on the tongue. So it's evidence of a contact on wound. What is hemorrhaging? Hemorrhaging is essentially um, bleeding. Were you able to make any conclusions regarding hemorrhaging to the tongue? Uh, yes. How did you go about doing that? So looking at the tongue just grossly or with the naked eye, I was looking for any evidence of hemorrhaging. Anytime an organ is fixed in the preservative formalin, Blood tends to have more of a brownish discoloration. Um, that's just what happens as it gets preserved. And I did notice there was some of that in the tongue. And I was also able to observe that under the microscope as well, that there was some hemorrhage. Was the hemorrhaging you observed consistent with what you would expect of an injury that occurred before that? The tongue is a very vascular organ. There's a lot of blood vessels. I mean, you know, if you bit your tongue before, it just bleeds a lot. So an injury like that, um, where it's almost completely torn up, you would expect it to be bleeding a whole lot. Um, and when I looked at the tongue, it didn't look like there was a whole lot of hemorrhage as I would have expected. In your observations of the tongue, did the damage that you described um, from the tongue, was that very clearly from the wound path and not from John Howard cutting it out? Yes, so when we removed the tongue, we cut, um, so as you know, the tongue kind of flaps up and down. We cut towards, like, for lack of a better word, the stalk, the, the back part of the tongue where your taste buds are. But we could see when I put the tongue back together um, that we could see that the tears that went through the middle of the tongue, that was all from the gunshot wound. Have you ever personally observed an intraoral wound path like that? With that extensive damage to the tongue, I have not. I've seen where it grazes the top of the tongue, but not like this. You previously testified that that bullet ended up in the cervical spine, is that correct? Right behind the, yes, the neck, the spine of the neck. Yeah. Um, Anita was asking if she was, um, if she, if Candy was conscious when she was shot. I, I don't think so. They said that the opening statements, the prosecutor said that they believed that she was already deceased when she was shot, and we don't know at what point she was placed in the bath or things like that. But the lack of blood in the bathtub was already a red flag. Now all of this that they're saying, it's not the usual amount of hemorrhaging you might expect if someone was alive at that point and had shot themselves in the mouth or even had been shot in the mouth. It's not the usual. It's as if the person was already dead when that gunshot happened, right? And the incident report actually says that, I wish we can look at sometime, um, it says that she died from asphyxiation. So the gunshot wound would have been after that. And did it actually transect a particular area? It went through the spinal canal and it transected the spinal cord in the neck. And did it lodge in a particular place? It lodged right behind the spine in the soft tissues. Was there a particular vertebrae? That would be at the level of the second cervical vertebrae. Is that known as C2? C2. At the time that that bullet did um, went through her tongue and into her C2, would that have resulted in an instantaneous lights out? 
a bullet that goes through the spinal cord of C2, uh, that high up in the neck, that would, yeah, that would, you would stop breathing right away, it's like lights out. If a person stops breathing, does their heart continue to beat? Yes, the heart can still beat on its own for some period of time. And is that, in fact, because the heart and the breathing system run on separate systems? So with the brain, the brain stem does have some regulation of the heart rates, but your heart actually has its own electrical system and can beat on its own for a while. Did the autopsy um, include an internal review of various organs? Yes. Were the organs weighed, and were those weights noted? Yes, all the organs were weighed at the time of autopsy. Did you review that information? I did. Is there anything that was notable to you about those organs? There was nothing anatomically wrong with any of the organs. There was no evidence of any infection, disease, or tumors, so they were otherwise pretty normal. Was any blood noted in the lungs? The lungs um, were congested, means there's some blood left there, and that's something that we see in every individual that dies, so there wasn't any more there than any other individual that I've seen who were deceased for other reasons. What about the stomach? The stomach had some contents, um, some food contents, but there was no evidence of any blood. Was that information notable to you? The fact that there was no evidence of any blood in the stomach or esophagus um, or even the airway, which that was documented in the autopsy report, that means uh, Ms. Kenny Howard did not aspirate on blood. She did not choke on her own blood. Was toxicology done in conjunction with this autopsy? Yes. And is that typically handled through the Spokane Medical Examiner's Office? So the samples are drawn at the Spokane office, however, they are sent out to an outside private laboratory for analysis. Would that um, have been then sent back to Spokane Medical Examiner's Office for inclusion in the autopsy? Yes, the results are returned to the Spokane office. What were the results in that case? The toxicology results, they were negative for any drugs or alcohol. I think the only thing that came up positive was caffeine. Did the toxicology result in this case include an expanded panel? Yes, an expanded panel was ordered. And so would that have included any prescription drugs that would have been in her system, such as antidepressants? Yes. And again, those were not present? They were not detected, no. <clears throat> now, in your independent review, did you have the opportunity to review photographs that were taken after the autopsy? Yes, I did. Do you recall um, the source of those photographs that you were able to review? I believe they were taken by the coroner at, after Ms. Kenny Howard went to the funeral. Did you make observations or was anything notable to you that was depicted in those photographs? Just noticed that the coroner's photos from the funeral home documented um, bruises that were more uh, noticeable than at the time of autopsy. Was that, the fact that they were more noticeable, was that surprising to you? That wasn't surprising just because in cases, especially with like child abuse cases, after we do the autopsy, we actually will keep the baby in the cooler for an extra day or two and then re-examine the skin because bruises that we did not originally appreciate at the time of autopsy, they become more vivid, they become more visible a day or two later. And that's just from the blood that's leaked out of the blood vessels coming closer to the surface of the skin. In your review of both the autopsy and the coroner's photos, were you able to make opinions as to discolorations that were injuries versus not injuries? Yes. Can you describe just a little bit about how the body might discolor in a way that's not an injury? So after a body's 
deceased. And I'm sure most of you have heard of liver mortis or lividity. That's just blood settling into the soft tissues. And that gives you a good idea of what the position of the body is. So if someone's deceased on their back, then you're going to have this like pink purple discoloration on the surface of the back that's not exposed to pressure. And that's also very useful, if, especially if the body's moved, and you can kind of get an idea that maybe that wasn't the original pers uh, position that the body was in when they died. Is that something that you're very accustomed to seeing? Liver mortis, yes. And when we're talking about discolorations to Kennedy Howard's body that you noted in autopsy as well as in your review of coroner's photos, were those injuries? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Sure. So, for example, when you were in the well pointing to discolorations to Kennedy Howard's body, were those, were those injuries that she had sustained or were they part of the body's decomposition. So the bruises that I pointed out in the photos that we all looked at, those were all injuries. And most of those would be due to blunt force trauma? Bruises, yes, due to blunt force trauma. Is there another injury that Kendi Howard has, specifically, she had a broken jaw? Yes, she did have a fracture of her left jaw. And would that have been in the location that you described the continuous swelling? Left jaw, yes. There was some fullness or swelling of her left jaw area. In the course of your review of materials, were you able to review more information than was available at the time of the original autopsy? I believe I received um, the additional photos that the coroner took at the funeral home um, and all the investigation reports from the coroner. Uh, I don't know if all of that was available at the time of autopsy. If the coroner's photos were taken after autopsy, then they wouldn't have been available before autopsy, right? Correct. If it was taken at the funeral home, which is after autopsy, right? And do you have the opportunity to review some investigative materials that were done after the autopsy was performed? I did uh, review the file, which had some information regarding the circumstances regarding her death that were, could have been done after the autopsy. When an autopsy cause of death is made, is it based on the circumstances as currently known? Yes. Based on your review of materials, would you rule Kenny Howard's manner of death to be suicide? I would not. Okay. Thank you. Cross-examination. Excellent witness, right? Ooh, let's see how this cross-examination goes. So based on everything we just heard, would Dr. Jennifer Nara rule Kenny's death, you know, that she took her own life? Nope, she would not. Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon. So, as far as bruising, we'll start with bruising first. Um, in an autopsy, you make note of any damage to a body, whether it's related to the cause of death or not, correct? Yes. And stuff like bruising, um, you make note of it, but you don't know the cause of a individual bruise. Sometimes we don't. And bruises can take, they can differ in how long it takes to discolor or the type of discoloration to show, right? Depending on the bruise, there could be some variation of discoloration. So for instance, I think there's, there's a bruise on the shoulder that has possibly have finger marks. Um, can you remember that photo? That was on the right shoulder, right upper arm area. A bruise like that could be caused, say, for instance, from sex, right? It could be. A, um, and lividity, we saw that in the back, that's the discoloration along the back side of the body, right? Yes. And additionally, um, where the uh, breast was, the right breast was laying on the water, let me back up. Doctor, do you know how long Ms. Howard was in the water, or in the bathtub? I do 
to not know the exact time. Uh, do you think you'd be, do you remember if you'd be around eight hours or so? Could have been eight hours. Okay. And uh, lividity, uh, that is when the blood settles in the body? Blood settles out of the blood vessels into the soft tissues, yes. Yeah. See, Jenny said, what did he just say? And Alicia said, did he say sex? He did. So he's obsessed with the Victoria's Secret bag and also like, ooh, those bruises could have been from sex, right? Yeah, he wants to keep on pointing in the direction of, you remember that affair? Yeah, so victim blaming all the way. Now, on the, uh, moving forward, on the trajectory of the gun, do you know what kind of gun was used in this case? Just know it was a semi-automatic handgun. You know if it had, how long the barrel was? I know it wasn't a long barrel, but I don't know the exact length. Now, when we're talking about gun angles and positions, um, there's a lot of unknowns when we're trying to put the pieces back together after the fact, right? There could be some unknowns. So, for instance, um, an upward trajectory would suggest, if it's a handgun, would suggest that uh, a gun is pulled with their trigger with a right index finger, correct? Right? Objection beyond the scope of foundation. She was asked about the Judge. No. Yes. This is beyond trajectory. He's asking about yeah. how a gun would be held. If you can lay like, foundation for the question, I don't know that it's necessarily going to scope. You've reviewed literature on gunshot trajectories. Yes, I have. There's a lot that goes into gunshot trajectories, correct? Right? Yes. And you're familiar with different methods that people hold guns while using them, correct? Yes. And uh, based upon your experience, uh, how someone holds a gun can impact the trajectory, right? Yes, it can. And uh, for instance, uh, you would agree that most intraoral gunshot wounds are Suicide, correct? The vast majority, yes. But it is rare to have a horizontal or slightly downward aim, right? In a suicide? In a, in a suicide. Uh, you can get horizontal, but downward is rare. Okay. And uh, so horizontal is, is more common than downward. Yes. Okay. Now, how a person holds a gun would impact trajectory, right? That's correct. For instance, if a person grasps a gun with their index finger on the trigger, that would be an upward angle, right? Objection, foundation beyond the scope. Overall, that would be on the scope. If the witness can answer, she can answer. I don't know if she knows that or not. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yes. Um, I can remember the example. The, if a person is holding a handgun with their index finger on the trigger, it is more likely to be an upward angle, correct? Again, Your Honor, I'm going to object. Move your approach. He keeps up wanting to ask the same question. Okay. Overruled the objection, Dr. Nora. If you know, you can answer. If you don't, you can answer that as well. I think if you have your index finger on the trigger, or even if you have your thumb on the trigger, I can see it going in an upward direction, sure. Okay. And if. Okay. Now, you would agree that a gun going off in the mouth causes injury, correct? Right? Yes. And you would agree that a gunshot going um, off in the mouth can cause fractures, correct? Right? Okay. Now, uh, 
the review uh, of this, let me back up. When a person dies, do you, do you know uh, when a person dies, how long a heart pumps? When you, are you asking like specifically when they stop breathing, their brain dead? Let's say I, uh, yes. It would depend, um, but I know the heart, because it has its own electrical system, will beat on its own for a while. This is something I've seen observing heart transplant surgeries where they take out a person's heart before they put the good one in there, and that heart is outside the body and it's beating on its own for several minutes. Uh, traumatic decapitations, we consider those people dead, they're not breathing, and it's very bloody because the heart still beat for a while. But it is common for the, the heart to stop pumping fairly short after? Um, it could pump for a few minutes. I just don't know exactly for how long. Now, you reviewed Dr. Howard's um, report and you made opinions on that. You asked about your opinions on that? Yes. And you made note of some bruising that he made some pictures that he may not have noticed? There was some bruising in the photographs that, um, that we looked at, yes. Now, the bruising on the mouth that he saw is consistent with damage that would be caused by, could be caused by a gunshot. Bruising of the mouth could be caused by a gunshot wound. Um, we talked about the body being received. Is that a careful process on transporting the body? Careful meaning? Is, is it just anyone that drops the body off, or is there, is it, how do you receive the body? So it would be, I don't know um, who Kootenai County uses for their transport service, but it would be a certain designated individual who takes it directly to the Spokane office where. Um, it would be received either by our autopsy technician and logged in. So the uh, does bruising occur after death, after the heart stops pumping? She asked if you could sustain a bruise after you're already deceased. Yes. Um, bruises can appear after you're already dead, but they would have been sustained prior. Now, he was probably hoping that would be like, oh no, you can get bruises after death. He would be like, ha, knew it. Okay, no, you can't. In this case, you reviewed the report that was done had a lot of hemorrhage on it, correct? The tongue, when I examined it, had some hemorrhage in it. Okay. Um, so you didn't just find her direct that there was a whole lot of hemorrhage in it? Are you asking when I looked at it after it was preserved? Yes. Um, I said there was some hemorrhage. Okay. Now, uh, do you know whether or not officers observed blood pooled in the back? I do remember reading that either from the investigation report or the paramedic report. You testified at a prior hearing in this case, correct? Yes. And uh, since that hearing, what have you been provided? Since that hearing, um, I think at the time of the grand jury hearing, I was provided all the photographs including autopsy photographs, the scene photographs, and the funeral home photographs. I don't recall if I received any new information since the hearing offhand. So, in your review, would you agree, you would agree that uh, it would be death by gunshot? I do not believe Ms. Kenny Howard died from a gunshot wound. Now, that is not what you testified to 
Could you clarify that, please? Uh, in the grand jury, you did not testify that Ms. Howard died by anything else in the gunshot, correct? I do not believe I was asked that specific question. So, in your uh, review, may I have a moment, Your Honor? You may. May I have a treat to this? You may. The entirety of your testimony, uh, pretty much for the grand jury, involved uh, gunshot wounds, correct? Do you object to the form of the uh, I'll rephrase your hand, Um You were asked extensively about um, intraoral gunshot wounds, correct? At the grand jury testimony? Yes. I was asked multiple questions about intraoral gunshot wounds. Now, on the, now, um, you provided, uh, you said you weren't providing any materials since, uh, let's say, May of 2023? Directly related to the case from the coroner's office, from their investigation, um, I didn't receive anything from the coroner's office. Have you received anything? Uh, in preparation for today, uh, that was not part of the terms of review prior. Yes. All right, and does that have an impact on your decision? I took that into consideration, yes. Okay. And were you provided uh, materials from both defense and the state? Yes, I was. Okay. Yeah. No further question. Thank you. Any regret? Sure. Ah, that was so good, right? <laughs> he didn't get anywhere with Dr. Nara. Specifically asking, because I'm not sure if the question was completed, but um, we saw this earlier, this discrete, almost kind of an irregular circular bruise on the outside of the right breast, uh, excuse me, right breast. Um, but I don't recall if that's what well, he was referring to versus the lividity here on the back. The discoloration to the breast, in your opinion, is that lividity or blunt force trauma? This here is a bruise. What about that lower part of the body? This all here is lividity on the back. Would that discoloration to the breast be the result of sitting in a bathtub? No. You can sit down. Sit back in your seat. Council asked you about a heart um, and how long it could beat after death. Do you recall that line of questioning? I do recall it. You mentioned that you had personally observed a heart outside the body. Do you understand that? Yes. How long did that heart beat? For several minutes. Yes. Approximately how long? At least 10, 15 minutes of my watching it, and then I stopped watching. And that was outside of the body, disconnected from a brain or respiratory system? Correct. It was just sitting on a surgical towel. Pumping. It was beating, yes. You recall counsel asked you about bruises after death. You recall that line of questioning? Yes. 
And you stated bruises appear after death, but they are sustained while alive. Do you recall that answer? I do recall it. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. I think I was asked this earlier about bruises becoming more vivid or more observable to the eye um, after a while, even after autopsy. I gave the example of child abuse cases where we would intentionally hold the, the baby in the cooler for an extra day or two so we could see if there's any other bruises that come to light that we did not observe at the time of autopsy. You were asked about um, blood pooling in the mouth. Do you recall that? Yes. This might be a silly question, but is the mouth connected to other parts of the body? Yes. And does it need to say airways and the stomach? Yes. And so if a significant amount of blood pooled in the mouth or the back of the throat, would you expect to see blood in lungs or in the stomach? The blood is pooling in the back of the mouth. Um, depending on the position of the head, just by gravity, it could go down um, potentially into the airway or into the upper part of the esophagus, but that would depend on the position of the head. Would the back of the mouth contain a significant amount of blood without that blood going somewhere else? Could it just sit there? Um, depends on how much blood is there. Some blood can remain in the mouth. And if the positioning of the head was such that the blood wasn't, the large amount of blood was not going into the lungs or the stomach, could it go out into the environment? Yes. You were asked by Mr. Johnson if you believe that Kenny Howard's cause of death was gunshot wound. And you said no. That's correct. Why? Given the additional information that I reviewed, given the circumstances surrounding the death, because we don't do an autopsy in a vacuum, we consider all the circumstances surrounding her death, I believe that she did not die from the intraoral gunshot wound. In making that decision or that opinion, did you consider the downward trajectory of the bullet? I did consider that. Did you consider the wound path through the tongue? Yes. Did you consider the level of trauma sustained to the body? Yes. Did you consider the swelling to the face? I did. Did you consider the burn to her arm? I did. Did you consider the unexpected amount of hemorrhage that you observed on the tongue? I did. Did you consider the lack of aspirated blood or blood in the stomach? I did. Did you consider all of those factors in leading you to the conclusion that Kenny Howard's cause of death was not gunshot wound? I considered all of those factors. Thank you. I think right. Thank you, ma'am. Very good. You may sit down. Thank you. You may have a Thank you, Judge. Sir, can you see your... Shame. Now they're going to have Candy's parents on the stand. I feel so sorry for them, you know. So this is this is her dad, and then they'll have her mom. So it's the final two witnesses for the day. We have four hours. We've watched four hours and 14 minutes out of four hours and 55 minutes. Uh, of today's footage so trial footage I say it like that because of course I defluffed it all I took it from 7 hours 52 I think it was down to 4 hours 55 taking all the breaks and fluff right shame man okay so this this might be difficult to hear emotional right Candy's dad your whole name is uh, both your first and last names Wendell Wilkins Wendell W-E-N-D-E-L-L -L. Wilkins W-I-L-K-I-N-S Mr. Wilkins, we're sorry. 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 Can I just have you pull that microphone a little closer to me just to help us all hear you? Thank you, sir. Where are you, Mr. Camion. How long have you lived in Camion? Uh, oh, most all my life. Are you married? Yes. Who's your wife? Jamie. Did you and your wife have a couple of kids? Yes. What were their names? Uh, Brooke and uh, White. Oh, no, <laughs> excuse me, Kendi and Brian. Who was older and who was younger? Brian was older. 
And are those two kids, Candy and Brian, the biological um, kids in your life? Yes. You also have a granddaughter named Candy. Yes. And what's her name? Brooke. And you have a great granddaughter named Brooke. Yes. And what's her name? Kinley. Where did you and your wife raise your children? Kenny. Okay, so did they grow up in Kenny and go to school in Kenny? Yeah, uh, there was a year or so we lived in Lewiston, <clears throat> but most all of it in Kenny. Right. And, and was there a point then when Kenny moved out of Kenny? Uh, yeah, when they got married. When who got married? Dan Howard and Kenny. Dan Howard here today? Yes. Can you please point him out and describe where he's seated tell us where he's wearing? Wearing a gray suit, light color shirt. When did you first meet Dan Howard? Uh, it would have been somewhere around 91, 92, somewhere in there. Was Candy pregnant or did she already have a child sure. when she got together with Dan Howard? She already had a child. About how old was Brooke when she got together with Dan Howard? When, how old? How old when she? Brooke? Yeah, Brooke. Uh, probably six, maybe. It was early age. Okay. Not sure? No, no. She was like one or two. Okay. All right. And, and after Dan and Candy got together, did eventually they moved out of town? Yes. And where did they go? Uh, Powell. Okay. And ultimately, did they um, settle in Coeur d'Alene? Yes. Okay. Growing up, um, what kind of uh, daughter was Candy in terms of her personality? Uh, Candy? Yeah. She was go lucky in all kinds of activities, uh, friends. She was. Was she outgoing? Yes, very. Was she positive? Yes. Did she enjoy life? Yes, a lot. What about guns? Um, did she like guns? Not to my knowledge. Okay. What are you basing that on? Well, all the time growing up. Uh, you know, I was a hunter, uh, this and that, went to hunting camp for a couple of weeks at a time. Brian went a few times, uh, Kendi never went. She, I never knew her to shoot guns. Did you ever see her shoot guns? No, I did not. After Kendi and Dan got together, got married, moved to Coeur d'Alene, did you attend uh, various functions uh, yes. at their house? Yes. Like, like what kind of functions? Graduations, birthdays, grandchildren, uh, uh, just a lot. Christmas, Thanksgiving, a lot of, it was, I don't know how many times a year, but it was a lot. So in that time period, did you get to know Dan Howard? Yes. Did you get to know Dan Howard's view on money? Yes. What was that? It was pretty conservative. It was basically his. He had pretty good control of it. Over the years, did you spend the night at their house in Apple? Yes. Okay. Let me show you some diagrams. They've already been admitted. We'll put them on the old one. Put this 2A to the let me show you this first one. It's 2A. Just to get your get yourself fully in the Are you in a position to see or get back a little bit of help? Yes, yeah, sir. If you want to, if you want to step into what we call the well here, that's this open area. You're welcome to step there. And, if, and I know that the prosecutor has a point here, if that's helpful too. Let me just point out a couple things. Does that look like the garage yeah. to their house and that would lead into the living room and stuff like that? Yes. And then is there an upstairs? Yes. And then is there a downstairs that isn't depicted on that tire? That isn't what? It's not there. Oh, okay. Let me show you the next exhibit there for the same type. It's been admitted as 2D. If you went downstairs, is that kind of the layout that you'd be looking at? Looks like it, yes. All right. And when you would spend the night there with your wife, where would you typically sleep? 
I usually sleep on that black couch. Okay, so this black couch, right? Here? Yes. All right, thank you. You can take your seat. Here. How many times do you think you spent the night there and slept on that black couch? Mm -hmm. Quite a few times. I can't say a number because it was quite a few times. Like over a period of 20 years or so? Oh, yeah. Could you hear, when you would spend the night on that black couch, things going on in the bedroom of Dan and Candy and Candy Howard above you? Yes. How well could you hear things going on when you were down in that basement in, in Candy and Dan's bedroom and or the attached bathroom in the hall? It was, it was faint, but you could understand what was going on. Could you hear them arguing yes. when you were down there? Which is a good question, because remember that Daniel Howard says he thought that, you know, he heard a thud, something hit the floor. He didn't think he heard a gunshot. Like, oh, yeah, right. Okay. Good question. Where could you hear them arguing from? From where I laid on the couch, their bed was straight above me. And, you know, there's vents in the floor, upstairs, downstairs, and it echoed right through those vents. So if they were in their bedroom, say on their bed, arguing, could you hear that? Yes. Could you hear the words or just the voices? Sort of the words you could hear arguing, especially Dan. He was a lot louder than Kindy. Uh, so, yes, I could hear. What about the bathroom across the hall from that bedroom? Could you hear, like, the water being turned on from the bathroom? Oh, yeah. It echoed a lot. Could you hear the toilet being flushed? Yes. Very could, you, could you hear voices in the bathroom? If yes. you were downstairs on that black leather couch. Yes, you could. Towards the latter half of 2020, did Kenny come down more often and hang out with you and your wife? Yes. And did that include hanging out with you, your wife, to Dan Prada? Yes. Okay. Can you can you describe for us her frame of mind in that time period? So the latter half of 2020 going into January of 2021. Her coming to Kamehai that last six or seven months, it was it was like old candy, just happy. She loved coming down here, no traffic. And, you know, it was just, she was back home, a lot of friends. And uh, that was good, she loved it. Do you know whether or not she was planning on moving down there? Yes. What did you know her to be wanting to do in the future? Of her money? In terms of moving down there. Yeah, she, well, she come and told me, oh, there one day that she was thinking about buying a house, and I asked her which one, and I knew the house, and she said, will you come look at it with me? And I did. It was, a, it's a nice house, and needed some repairs, uh, updates. So, she worked it out where she could do it. Did you know that she was getting divorced, Yes. Did you know or suspect that she was in a relationship with Mr. Prado? They never told us that, but you did maybe suspect it. When she was, she came down, she mostly stayed at our house. But did you know she was planning on quitting her job? To yes. Did yes. she talk about getting a new job? Yes. In Canada? Yes. Was she depressed at all in that time frame? Yes. Understood uh, the objection. If you could restate the, uh, I'll sustain the objection as it was asked, but you can restate the question. Mr. Wilkins, how old are you? 70. In your 70 years of existence, have you ever seen someone who's been depressed? Yes. And are you familiar with the signs of depression based on your 70 years of living? I'm sure I am, yes. And in that last six months that you were around your daughter, did you see any signs of depression? No. Let me take you to January 29th of 2021, okay? January 29th, 2021, all right? Several days before she died, okay? Early that morning, did you get a call, or did your wife get a call from Dan Prado? Yeah, there was a phone call, yes. Okay. Just for anyone who missed it yesterday, we heard Daniel Prado on the stand, who was Kendi's new relationship.
Remember, she was getting divorced from Daniel Howard. She was excited for her future. She was going to buy a house. She was going to get a job in Kamei, which is close to her parents. Um, you know, she was going to get a mommy makeover. And she just had her nails done that day. And she was really excited for her new life without Daniel Howard, the defendant. And so on January 29th of 2021, four days before Candy was murdered, allegedly, um, there was a call made because... Kendi had called her boyfriend, but she wasn't talking to him. She just had him listen in. And it was um, her arguing, well, actually Dan arguing with her, not wanting her husband, arguing with her, not wanting her to be alone in the bathroom and saying, who are you talking to? And all kinds of stuff. And don't get confused now because the boyfriend and the husband both are called Daniel, Dan, right? So the boyfriend heard this and thought, what? So he called um, her parents. He called Kendi's parents and said, I don't know what's going on there, but something's not quite right. Can you try call her? Because obviously he didn't want to call her in case it would set off the husband, right? And so they called for a welfare check. And we saw that yesterday. We saw body cam from that. We saw Kendi pack her bags. We heard that she went to Kamii to stay with her parents for a night. Then her boyfriend told her, don't go back. Like, it's not safe. Don't go back. And she said, well, now... The husband wouldn't do anything because now the police have been involved. Everybody knows and all of that. So she'll be fine. She has to go back to look after animals and she's got a job to go to. And unfortunately, she was allegedly murdered just four days later. So that is what they're referring to right now. So if you missed it, it is timestamp for you from yesterday. Go and check that out. Testimony was very powerful from that guy who really sounds like he loved her very much. I really wish that Kenny had rather been with that guy, right? Daniel Prado. Loki, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Because of that call from Mr. Prado, did you or your wife to do something? Yes. What was that? Uh, I started calling Kendi. She wasn't answering. I called approximately, I think, three times, and finally she answered. And her voice was, she was crying. She was, you could tell she was scared. And I said, you're in trouble, aren't you? And she said, yes. And we just kept talking. And, and I asked her what, what was going on. She said, I was woke up. Uh, Dan was over me. And, and was there an objection? There is. I'm sorry? There is. So just to back up from that January 29th, 2021 date, um, that is the night that Kendi, she was asleep, she woke up and her husband was standing over her dressed in black, wearing black gloves, had a mask on, all kinds of stuff. It sounded really scary. It sounds like he was planning to murder her that night. I don't know what happened, but uh, I mean, why his plans changed? Horrible to say, but you know what I mean? Like, what, what happened there? But then there was this fight, you know, and she ran to the bathroom and she was trying to close herself in it and he didn't want her to. And that's when she dialed her boyfriend and just let him listen in. So that's from that night. If you remember, we had heard about another, we had an, another 911 call that was on the first day. And that was actually from July of 2020. So it's like seven months before. And that was a domestic battery incident where Candy's ear had been like it was like all red and damaged and her chest was bruised and we saw photos from when uh, she went camping with friends as in her and her husband and another couple and she had bruising all over her chest and all that kind of stuff so that was from july of 2020 what they talk about now is january 29th of 2021 four days before the murder let me ask you a couple follow-up questions all right so did you have a conversation with kenny when she picked up yes and was she crying during this conversation? Yes. Was she, did she seem to you to be upset? Yes. Did she tell you what had just happened to her? Yes. Can you tell us what she told you had just happened to her? She said she was sleeping. She woke up. Dan was over, had something like maybe a pillow. She couldn't see the other hand. Didn't know what was there. And she said, what are you trying to do to me? And from there, but when I was talking to her, I think she had already moved to the bathroom. And she stayed in there 
all the time when I was talking to her. When you were talking to her, could you hear Dan in the background? I heard him one time. What, did you, what did you hear him say? Uh, I would never hurt your daughter. Did you or your wife after this? Oh my word. It's so weird. He's like in the background being like, I would never hurt your daughter. Sure. Okay. Conversation called 911. Of the court of Yes. The wife had already been trying to get a hold of Coraline and believe she had been talking to him. And they, from what I was, the officers were coming at this out there. And Kendi was staying in the bathroom until they showed up. And we just kept talking to each other. And how long did you talk to her? It was a good 20 minutes, probably. Were you talking to her still when the police came? When they came, yes. And she said, they're here. And I said, okay. And that's when we disconnected. Right. Later on that day, on January 29th, did she come down to Cami Yes. You and your wife's house over here. What was her mental condition then? She was still really shook up. She was shook up. At times, she started tearing up, and you know, she was really just scared. So we can't get into what she was telling you down in Camia, okay? But I want to ask you some questions about what you did. At some point, when you and your wife um, were talking to her, was Dan Prado also there? Yes. Okay. And at some point, the conversation with Kendi when she was describing what happened. Did you go and retrieve a handgun? Yes, I did. What kind of handgun? It was a 380 auto, auto handgun. Ribbon. What did you do with it? I showed it to her. I said, you need to take something. If you're going back, she said she was going back. She had some stuff to do with her job to turn in notification to, and she had to get her, I believe her fingernails and that done and her eyeglasses and the appointments were hard to get, she had to make those, and she mentioned that he already done something, so he's not going to do it again. At some point, did you take the magazine out of that gun? Yes. And lay it down? Yes. She was sitting, I don't know, six or seven feet away. I showed it to her. She said, I don't like guns. And then I took the clip out and I threw it on the floor. Actually, I even laid the gun on the floor. And I said, what happened to yours? She did, she didn't know. But then when I laid that clip, magazine, whatever you want to call it, on the floor, she just pointed. That's what I saw on the floor at home. Did she end up driving home that day? Uh, no. The next day? The next morning. We tried talking her into saying that she wouldn't. She had to go home. Why? For those nails and you know, I'm gonna have to get the nails done and the eyeglasses and the appointment to turn in her uh, for resignation at the hospital and start the divorce papers. Get hopefully getting them signed. Okay. What was that the last time you saw your daughter? Yes. Was that the last time you talked to her? For me, yes. All right. Did you end up driving out to Athol on February 2nd, 2020, 2021? Yes, I did. Why? Because Kendi usually always calls in the morning, calls to the wife. She didn't call. Jane woke me up. And the same. Kendi is a caller. Well, anyway, start checking and Call the hospital. No, she's not here. Then call the <coughs> dispatch, and they didn't tell us much of anything. And then a little bit later, we found out that she was dead. How did you find out? Was I, think, I think it was Brooke that finally called. When did you find out that your daughter was dead? When we got up there. What time was that? It was approximately maybe 9 30, 10. Right. And so when you got up there, you mean the Howard residence in Athol? Yes. So did you and your wife drive up to Athol that morning? Yes. 
Yes. So you drive up where you park? I parked out in a parking lot quite a ways from that house in the shop. So before the shop? Yes, out in front. You know, there, yeah, it was quite a little ways from the shop in the house. Why did you park away from the shop in the house? Because there was people all around there and this and that. And Wyatt, he came out uh, and of the shop and started talking to me. And so that's where we, him and I visited for a little bit. What was the substance of your conversation? I, you know, I knew she was dead. And I knew the situation that was previously. And I said, you know, your dad did this. And why? Go ahead. And Wyatt stood there crying, uh, both of us, and he had his head down and he's shaking it when I asked that question. Ooh, that's hectic. Okay, so uh, the victim, Candy, had a daughter from a previous relationship, and her and Daniel Howard had a son called Wyatt. Now, both kids were adults at the time, and so they did say yesterday, it was yesterday that he pulled. One of the days they said when Brooke, which would be Dan Howard's stepdaughter, came over to the house, she the police took note that she immediately said, you killed my mother. Like, you killed my mother. And they were like, whoa. And he was visibly upset, they said, and all of that, because she was accusing him. Well, then we were saying yesterday it would be interesting to hear how Wyatt, their son, responded. And here, Kendi's dad is saying that Wyatt was there and they were at the house and he said, you know, your dad did this, right? <laughs> now there's obviously objections from the defense, of course, because he's like, oh, well, Wyatt was going, yep, like nodding his head. Wow. That's also very telling. Objection here says, it sounds like he's about to give a hearsay statement. And so I'll sustain the objection as to what Wyatt said in response. Did Wyatt say anything or did Wyatt do it? When I asked, when I said that, he was shaking his head. And that is so telling. Look, look, <laughs> he's very nervous to answer this question because they're like, nope, nope. Also, for those of you asking, what is the, the yellow thing on the table? It is a pack, um, like a packet of disinfectant wipes. So after that uh, medical examiner was on the stand and she had a mask on and she had a cold, right after that, there was a lot of fluff that I cut out <laughs> where somebody who works here in the court I shouldn't see if it was the prosecutor or someone who works at the court. I think it's someone who worked in the court. He had come out with this packet and there was a lot of fluff, okay? Just fiddling with the packet, opening the packet, and then wiping down this entire stand. So, let's see. It was wet wipes, okay? Disinfectant wipes, in case you're wondering. What is that? That's what it is. You said, yeah. I'm sustaining the objection. And the juror disregarded the last statement as to what Wyatt responded. Sorry, but they already heard it. <laughs> like, listen, Jerry, you have to disregard that. But they're like, mm, we already heard. So, Wyatt, Daniel Howard's own son was like, mm hmm, yeah, I know my dad did this, yeah, pretty much. Wow. You say there were other people besides Wyatt who came out. Did Wyatt come to be you and your wife in the car? Yes. Yeah. Wyatt and Tiffany Bowen. Is that a girlfriend? I believe so, yes. Did anybody, who are the other people that were there? My wife. I, I don't know who recognized the other people. I never saw Dan. He never came out. Okay, so were there any police still there? Say what? Were there any police? I think there? there was one, maybe. Okay. All right, so. I think Dan was probably still somewhere howling at the moon or the rising sun or barking or doing some kind of performance, right? That morning uh, when your daughter died, did Dan, Dan called you, I take it? Huh? Did, what time did Dan call to let you know? He's never Dan called Dan? us once. He never has called us or spoke to us. Oh my word. So he... Sorry, sorry for the pausing. I'm just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. we have to just like break this down. Daniel Howard has never called the parents, not one time. Ooh, that's a red flag. That is so telling. I'm so glad the jury's hearing, hearing all of this because he never called to say, I mean, he put on a performance for the police as we saw in the body cam, right? And then also checked, oh, they're still watching. Okay, continue with that performance. Wow. 
Didn't even call his in-laws at all. Sure. Did not call you the day the candy died? No. The next day? No. The day after that? No, never. When you drove up and parked in his driveway the day your daughter died, I assume he came out and talked to you? No. Did you see him come out? No. Why didn't you go in and find him? I wasn't about to go in there. I did. If I would have. Hang on, I'm just getting up, all right? Did you end up um, seeing Kendi at a funeral home? Yes. How long after this happened? About? Um, probably four or five days. Okay. And during that, that time that you were at the funeral home, who else was there? Oh, shoot. There was my wife and I. There was uh, some of my relations showed up. Uh, there was a couple of Kennedy's classmates that live in uh, towards Athol. Uh, it, and when you were there with your wife and those people, were you in a, a, a close spot to the person that ran that funeral? Excuse me? Were you close to the person that was running that funeral home? Uh, when we was all outside, no. And when then we went in, then we sat in the lobby for a while and then went in and viewed Kendi. And then they went and set up for the, oh, for the cremation and for getting some uh, death certificates. During the time we were there, did you hear Dan Howard on the television? Yes. Yeah. Okay, how did that come to pass? It was over, I believe it was death certificates and who was going to pay for the funeral. Who? Or the cremation and that. How did it come to pass that you heard Dan Howard on the phone? He was on the speaker. Okay, so did Dan Howard call somebody at the funeral home when you were right there? I believe it was Wyatt that called. Okay. And could you overhear the conversation between Dan Howard and Wyatt? Some of them, yes. What did you the part that you could hear, what did you hear? It was one part there that he would pay for the funeral, but nothing extra. Oh my word. He's like, I'll pay for the funeral, but nothing extra. Who did it? Cremation, I mean, the cremation. Okay, and, and but nothing other than the cremation? Okay, correction. You would only pay for the cremation and nothing extra. Not the funeral, nothing else. What? Thankfully, the jury's hearing all of this. Let's talk about the funeral. Was there a funeral for oh, yes. Where did the funeral take place? Uh, Camia. How long after she died on February 2nd? About. Oh, shoot. I can't really remember how many days or a week or two or whatever it was. I, I, I can't remember that. I know it was uh, a large one. Where was it? Catholic, Catholic Church. And about how many people came? Uh, two to 250 people. There was classmates from New York and Texas. And I couldn't believe that there was probably close to 30 of uh, her classmates that showed up. Did Dan come to her funeral? No. Yeah. Oh my word. He didn't go to the funeral either? So he's like, you'll only pay for the cremation? Daniel Howard, the defendant. He's so going down. So he didn't pay. You only wanted to pay for the cremation. Of course he did. Not the funeral. Didn't attend the funeral. Never called her parents, his in-laws. He was married to Kendi for like 27 years. And he never... And, and the dad has already said, Kendi's dad, that he stayed over at the house many times over those decades. And he couldn't even call her dad and thankfully not put on that performance because that's why he can't. <laughs> they know him too well. He can't perform like that. They'll know this is fake. What the heck is going on here? Wow. Oh my goodness. Dan helped pay for her funeral. No. Did Dan pay for the plot and her film and the camera? No. Who paid for that? I paid the plot. We haven't got the stone yet. We're waiting for... Brooke and 
everybody to get together to figure out what to put on. I don't have any more questions to be sure, but this gentleman might. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Oh, boy. We're going to have cross examination now. What? Cross examination, Mr. Johnson. Why is your answer? Yeah. Now, there was an opinion. You formed an opinion early on after the passing about the gun. No, okay. And that opinion was expressed very vocally within the family, right? Yes, it was. And do you know if Mr. Howard was instructed not to? I will try. Um, you mentioned a conversation that you overheard with Wyatt and Mr. Howard, correct? Wyatt and Mr. Howard? Yes. Wyatt and Dan. No. Now, Dan paid for the cremation. Yes. And there was a viewing. Yes. And uh, a, a little service there at the funeral. Not really a service, just a going and then meeting with the mortuary person. And everyone gathered together. And there was, yes. Okay. And the funeral at the church down the canyon was well after that. Yes. When you first arrived on that morning, you mentioned that you saw law enforcement there? I believe so. There was vehicles that I didn't know. I, I don't know if there was law enforcement or maybe something with, I don't know. I don't know who they were. Did you ask to speak to him? No. Do you I, know if he was, at that point, he did um, law enforcement are doing an investigation of these sort. No, I didn't know anything. Okay. How long was your conversation with Mr. Prado um, when he called you on the night of the 29th? No. No? He just called you? And the just, night of the 29th? Yes. The night that Ms. Howard, uh, your daughter, you were on the phone with her. The night of the 29th? I was up there. Did you hear it? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, no further questions. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> wow, that did, not, that did not last very long. He's just like, sorry, what? The night of the 29th, which was four days before. He just like jumped around with the timeline. Oh, Mr. Wendell Wilkins here is like, what are you asking me? Basically, his face is like, and <laughs> Jason is like, no, no, no further questions. When you talked to Candy on the 29th, yes. that was in the morning, wasn't it? Early in the morning. Yes. It wasn't at night. It wasn't at night. It was dark, but it was not. Right. Okay. It was still morning. Got it. And we all know that because we saw the body cam. So why does the defense attorney not know that? It was like 5.45 in the morning, right? Five-ish. Okay. So you were asked the question by counsel about why you didn't speak to Dan when you came up on February 2nd after your daughter was dead. Why is that? Because I never. I never spoke to him that night. Didn't know him. Counsel asked you a question about why you didn't ask, ask to talk to Dan Howard when you drove up there. I didn't think it would be a good situation. No further questions. All right. Thank you, sir. You may sit down. And now we've got um, the last victim, uh, sorry, victim, sorry, the last witness for the day, which is the victim's mother. Okay, so she's going to be taking the stand. Forensic Fuhrer, <laughs> pop quiz. <laughs> I know you're keeping count. Which witness number is this? Okay, so this will be Janie Wilkins. Shame. Can you say your name and spell your last? Janie Wilkins, W I L K I N S. What can I do with you? Can I? Who's your husband? Pardon? Who's your husband? Wendell. Do you and Wendell have children? Yes. Okay. And what kind of children do you have? Two boys and a girl. Okay. Do you know what their names are? Candy and Brian. I understand from recently speaking to your husband that they grew up in Canada. 
Chicago yes. Community High School? Yes. And it went all the way through high school from Camion? Is that yes. right? How did your daughter do in high school? No. Fair. <laughs> okay. Was your daughter a happy person or not? Oh, yeah. Okay. Did your daughter eventually leave Camion? Yes. Why was that? Um, she left right after high school and then she came back and then she got married and then they moved. Got married to whom? Dan. Dan Howard here today. Dan Howard, yes. Can you please point Dan Howard out for us and tell us where he is and what he's wearing? Gray suit right behind the monitor thing. Growing up with your daughter, did you get an opportunity to learn her attitude towards guns? Yes. What was that? She was never around guns. She never. We never went hunting with the guys or shooting. Growing up um, or getting older after Kendi married Dan and they moved to Coeur to go on occasion, go to Coeur and spend holidays with them? Yes. Um, and did that go on for 20 plus years or whatever? Yes. During that time, did you get to know Dan? Yes. Did you get to know Dan's attitude towards money? Yes. So what was that? He was tight. Tight, conservative, controlling. We've heard all those words, right? So we only, we've got 10 minutes uh, left of this trial footage for the day. Had a cow over anything she spent. Towards the latter half of 2020, can you start coming down to the county on the wall? Yes. Would you come down when Dan was in the last door? Yes. And how long would she spend down there? The weekend. Okay. What was her frame of mind during that latter half of 2020 into January 21? She was good. Was she, she was happy. Was she was ready to move on. Was she looking forward to the future? Yes. Did she express to you what her future held for her? Yes. What was that? She bought a house. She was really excited about that. And she wanted to open up a little secondhand antique store. When she was down there, did it often happen that you, your husband, Candy and Dan, proud of hung out together? Yes. Often? Well, we hung out with Dan before Candy even came down. I get that. But when Candy started coming down, did the four of you also hang out? Yeah. Okay. So I assume that you and your husband were accepting of Dan Prado? We never knew anything was really going on until a long time. Okay. We knew their friends. They've always been best friends. What sorts of things did the four of you do during that time frame, say in 2020? At our house, everybody usually comes to our house and we have bonfires and stuff. So most of the time it was there. We'd go fishing, we'd go bowling, we'd go to NRA events, okay. out to eat, hang with friends. Uh, and did you, are, are you you're on Facebook? Yes. Did you ever take photos of the four of you doing those types of things? No. And I don't take pictures. Did anybody ever take photos of the four of you doing those things and that get posted on your Facebook? Mm -hmm. Yeah, stuff we were doing. Yeah. Okay. And so if someone were looking at your Facebook back in the latter part of 2020 or, or January 21, would they see pictures of the four of you together? No. Would they see pictures of the four of you doing things um, on your Facebook? I think so. Okay. How often would you talk to Kendi? Most every day. When would you and her talk? Usually after work. Okay. Or on her way home from work most time. Would she call you at times from the bathtub? Yes. How often would she call you when she took the bath? She took a bath every night. Yeah. So it was just like if, you know, most time it was texting by that time. Okay. When she would text you, was that on a regular basis? Oh, yeah. Yes. Did you do that basically on the daily routine with your daughter? Probably. Let me take you to um, January 29th of 2021, okay? Mm -hmm. At some point in the early morning hours where you and your husband woke up. Yes. Tell us what happened. Daniel called and said he didn't know what was going on at Kindy's, but something bad, and I just hung up and called. 911. Again, to clarify, January 29th of 2021, four days before the alleged murder, 
uh, Candy's mother saying Daniel called. It was Daniel Prado, Candy's boyfriend, who called. Now don't get confused because her husband's name is also Daniel, but that's Daniel Howard. Okay? So I went over that little recap when it was the dad's testimony. So I'm not going to go over it all again now. <laughs> it was going to annoy everyone who's been watching here with us all day, always watching the entire replay. But that is what happened, okay? Did your husband continue to talk to your daughter? I talked to her at first. Oh, that's what I talked to her first. And um, then I get rid of the phone and called my name. Did you report to the 911 operator what you knew I, or thought you knew was going on? I just said something bad's happening and give them the address. Your uh, address in Apple? Yes. Later on that day, did your daughter come down to Canada? Yes. And how was her mental health condition there? What was her demeanor? She was a mess. What do you mean? She was just sobbing and, you know, just went on what happened, told us what happened. Okay. Did she end up leaving? The next, about 10 the next morning. All right. And did you and your husband try to talk her out of that? Oh, yeah. Did you have any success? No. Why? Because she said she had to get home because she had an eye appointment and she had other appointments. She had seen a lawyer Monday. She was giving her notice Tuesday. And so she had to go home to take care of that stuff, she said. Okay. Did you and your husband drive up to Athol on February 2nd, 2021? Did yes. That? Yes. How long time did you February 2nd of 2021 is the day that the alleged murder happened, okay? So it was four days before that Candy had packed her bags and gone and stayed with her parents uh, for a little bit. I think it was just one night. Earlier I thought maybe they said a weekend, but I think it was just for a night or so and then she'd gone back. Because she said she had animals to look after and a job to get to and things to sort out, you know, before starting her new life. And a job to get to would be to resign so that she could move to Kamiai to a new house where she bought a hot tub and everything for it. She was so excited. And it sounds to me like uh, the defendant, Daniel Howard, was not going to let her go. I wonder if he had any other relationships like ever, because it's starting to sound almost like not. Not sure, you know, because uh, Kenny's mother said they were best friends. They were always best friends. You know, it sounds like someone very possessive and controlling and just didn't want it to be with anyone else. I think it was around 11 or 12. And what was the reason you and your husband drove off Candy Eye to Athol? Well, we were told what happened. We didn't know where else to go, so we went out there to see if anybody was there. Okay. Did, do you remember who told you what had happened? Brooke. Okay. Um, what happened when you got up to the house in Athol? Wyatt and his girlfriend came out to the room. Did Dan ever come up to you? No. Call? Did Dan ever call you that day and then out with all of you? No. I haven't talked to Dan since December 26, 2020. Was there a point in time after she died where she was at the funeral home, before she was cremated? Yes. And were you able to listen in on a conversation, telephone conversation Dan had? Yes. Another person? Yes. Can you tell us about that? I think it was the funeral director. And Dan wouldn't answer his phone, so I think then Wyatt called him. Not here at this point, so I'll overrule the objection. Did you hear Dan? Okay, Pauls. Phoebe says his girlfriend, what? No, they said Wyatt and his girlfriend. Wyatt is the son. You know, Candy and Dan's son's name is. Wyatt, and they said Wyatt and his girlfriend came out. Just to clarify, okay? His voice. Yes. Do you recognize Dan's voice? Yes. And you heard the voice of another person in this telephone conversation? No. Well, was that other person there at the funeral that Dan was talking oh, to? Oh, Wyatt? Yeah. Yes, he Yes, is. okay. Can you tell us um, the gist of that conversation? Um, he actually calls her, isn't in what way? He's not saying he's just sort of getting to take this from Wyatt and being here. And I would try to say this again. Well, tell me your statements from Wyatt would be context for the admissions from 
Council's comments. So I'll overrule the objection. Any statements by the, um, the defendant are not here saying this is a part of the law. Sorry. If I'm <laughs> yeah, I think you saw me being a mom to the cats. Hey, 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 hey. They're literally busy fighting over the armchair in the office. Distracting us over here. Okay, hold on. Statements made to him are not to be considered for the truth of the matters, but rather just to explain the conversation. Ma'am, can you tell us the gist of that conversation? Yes, Dan was telling the funeral director that um, he'd take care of everything, blah, 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 whatever the family wanted, this and that. And then later it was, he wasn't paying for anything else. And so did Dan pay for his wife to be cremated? Yes. Did Dan pay for the funeral held afterwards? No. Did Dan come to the funeral held no. afterwards? Did Dan come and be present or did he pay for her burial? No. She hasn't been buried yet, but she has the plot in the... Who bought that? We did. Judge, the rest of my direct is going to include um, a number of Facebook Messenger texts. It's a bit lengthy. It's going to run past five rather than start it and stop at some point. You know, in between the court being able to stop it today. That's um, certainly that's fine. So. Okay, we'll recess for the day at this time. Get a close up of him right here. Damn. The camera person is like, look, 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 look at his ear. Look. Look at his side profile. This is the defendant right here. We'll be in a recess at this time. Day three. Complete. Now I can't see the full word. Hold on. Complete. <laughs> Compl co no, no, wrong button. There we go. Day three, complete. Okay, so it sounds like I haven't lurked, I haven't peeked, okay? <laughs> it sounds like on day four, which we'll watch tomorrow, that Kenny's mom will be back on the stand, going over Facebook messages and things, I think. So, that that's the day three for us, complete, okay? Let me take this off. This is such a nice picture of... Candy look and grizzly cat found this picture for us i don't know where because i looked all over facebook <laughs> couldn't find all these this beautiful picture here it's just so nice so thank you to grizzly cat for finding that and brightening uh, brightening it up a little bit for us as well was improving the quality of the photos too so yeah <clears throat> yeah who said wait i can't oh there we go yeah janice like complete is not complete i know right he, he is complete the day is complete. <laughs> so, I do have another live stream planned. Surprise, mods. <laughs> okay, I have one more live stream planned, which I'm, I haven't set up yet. I'm going to set it up now. It'll be happening in the next, you know, half an hour to 45 minutes, okay? So, what's the time now? It's 20 past 10 my time. I'm going to set it up as quick as I can. I've got to make the thumbnail and the whole thing, you know? So, maybe from this moment, less than an hour from now, 45 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes. Because I want to watch um, Kayla Montgomery's parole hearing with you. Tomorrow we're going to be back for day four. Fighting for justice. For Kendi. I really hope that the jury is hearing all of this and taking notes, right? They're allowed to take notes. Because, wow. I think this is, to me, it seems like a slam dunk case. What do you think? I don't know how any juror is going to think, mm, he probably didn't do it. How are they going to think that? This just seems so... And remember, we are not the jury. We are not the judge. We are allowed to have an opinion. Okay? I think he's guilty. <laughs> Let me know what you think. So, I'm going to take this picture off for now. And I'm going to see you in the next stream, hopefully. Hopefully you all come and watch because, yes, Kayla Montgomery. We watched the Adam Montgomery trial together last. Remember the trial just before this one? Was the Adam Montgomery trial and there was talk of Kayla Montgomery having a parole hearing coming up. So we scribbled that down in our diary, and that's today. It happened today, and she was granted parole. So let's watch the hearing, shall we? Uh, yes, thank you. Rob says justice for Kendi. Forensic Fuhrer says yes, slam dunk. So, so far, by the way, someone was asking, are the kids on the witness list? 
in this case, the documents aren't readily available. You have to ask for them and then you've got to pay for them and all of that. So Grizzly Cat was helping me today um, to get those witness lists and also the indictment. So I will show that to you tomorrow morning. Uh, well, tomorrow morning. <laughs> See, I'm already on American time. For me, I'm starting the stream at like 5 p.m. But tomorrow, when we meet again for day four, I will show you that, okay? Because maybe we could go over who else could be expected. So far, they've had 17 witnesses and they're expecting 55 to 60 and it's supposed to be a three-week trial so yes so tomorrow we're going to do day four which is friday and then day five we'll catch up on over the weekend on saturday it's my birthday so mr grizzly and i are going to do a small outing in the morning i don't want to do anything overwhelming or go anywhere far or something because we just moved countries <laughs> it's a little bit much right now so just something small so i don't know if i'm going to be seeing you on my birthday in the afternoon or the next day but I will see you so we can catch up with day five. And then we'll be all caught up by Monday. And then I'll need lots of coffee for next week because I'm going to be starting my streams at like 7 p.m. and running till 2 or 3 in the morning because of the time zone. You know, the Pacific time is nine hours behind me now. And once your clocks change, because you guys in America change two weeks before us in Europe, daylight savings is going to be eight hours behind me. So got a lot of calculations to do. But yeah, next week is going to be very interesting. So... Please make sure you are subscribed, okay, with your notifications on. In the next 15 minutes, please come to my channel and check, check, because there should be a live stream there for you. Click notify me and I'll see you there. How about that, okay? Your Forensic Furious says Patreon live stream. <laughs> when? <laughs> you know what my problem is? When? We've got to do a Patreon only live stream. We've got to do members only live streams. We've got to do this trial. We've got to do the Kayla Montgomery one. But yes, as soon as I can fit it in, I will. I will. Are you talking about the birthday? Maybe, maybe. Okay, I'll definitely be showing birthday pictures on Patreon, yes. And today, I uploaded some uh, pictures of Switzerland and, you know, some little food haul things on Patreon. So if you're interested in seeing that, go check it out. If you haven't checked out Patreon before, go check it out. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining me for day three of this trial. I look forward to day, to day four with you. And, yeah, I'll see you then. Okay, bye, everyone.